the first interaction where that actually came to, to where he was biting somebody, how did that go down? One of the guys comes in and says, hey, the marshals are here. They got a guy in town that's hiding out, and uh, they've been tracking him all over the country, and they, and they got him pinned down to a trailer park. So He was uh, an Aryan Brotherhood on the run. So I thought, well, all right, let's run out here and grab I make my way down the hall with the dog. It's a trailer, so the, the room is really small, but it's full of stuff, full of clothes and stuff. He's, he's in there searching and nothing. And I'm thinking, well, heck, this guy's not in here. He's got out. I just peel back a little bit of the clothes and, and boom, here it is. The fight's on. He comes up out of the clothes. Now I'm fighting. I'm in there by myself because nobody else wants to come in because there's a dog in there. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, why is my 90 pound Dutch Shepherd not attached to this man? A canine handler that was with me, he comes through the crowd, comes in. And when he does, he's got an MP5 here. And the guy reaches up, boom, snatches it. We managed to get the gun back. And, uh, and I'm still in my mind thinking, where's my dog? So I'm yelling for him. I look over out of the corner of my eye and I see about that much of his tail sticking out. And he's been under there the whole time, attached. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. So, this guy's like, it's not even happening. Never made a noise. This this 90 pound Dutch Shepherd now is practically taking off his calf. It's coming out. It's coming off. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 29 years as a law enforcement officer with the Morristown Police Department right outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, 22 of which was with the canine department. He is the owner and CEO of Integrity Canine. He spent uh, two years on the West Coast with the SEAL Canine program. His favorite band of all time is Warrant. How's that for a That's fucking great. bad yeah. bad dad joke? And yet he's the last guy on the planet you want to see holding a leash in your direction. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Dan Cliff. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I know uh, <clears throat> through through one of my, well, through I guess a, a mutual friend of ours slash my right-hand man at the Kennel, Neil, um, kind of lined this up for us to be able to talk. I know you've known him for a number of years and, and worked with him quite a bit. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to, to come here and sit down. I know you've got a... a treasure trove of stories and, and experience in the canine world and law enforcement. And, uh, you know, we always lo love to have uh, guys like you on the show and, <clears throat> and hats off and respect to you. And so I, uh, I'm looking forward to picking your brain and talking to you for a little bit. What's your, uh, favorite cop show or movie? Oh gosh. You know, the scary part is that I try not to watch a ton of them. Yeah. <laughs> just hypercritical of them. Yeah. Well yeah. that, and or they're just all cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know that I, I, of course, everybody loved Cops when it first came out. Yeah. We thought that was the coolest thing since, yeah. you know. Did you watch that much? I, I actually did watch it, yeah. and then I, and I got to the point where I was like, oh, my God, it's, yeah. it's, it's terrible. It's like, uh, it's kind of like a truck driver going for a drive on <laughs> yeah. his off time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what I tell everybody. Yeah. Uh, what's the most accurate police, can, uh, or police stereotype? Um, the most accurate one? Would be uh, sometimes we're a little cocky. <laughs> yeah. What uh, I, I guess from your from well, I mean to me, there's there's an element. I mean, kind of like with the SEAL teams, there's you know I think the nature of the job um, requires a, a level of confidence that borders on that, yep, or, sure does. or or your life's going to be in danger, really. So I mean, you know, to me, there's there's an element that that has to be there, but. Um, I guess from your experience, have you run into to that a lot in your uh, within your department, or? Well, not, not a whole lot because uh, our department's just about a hundred hundred man, and so we can keep a pretty tight rein on yeah. attitudes and yeah, you know. But at the same time, you you do have to have a level of uh, confidence in yourself, otherwise, yeah, you get run over. Yeah, so. I, I suppose uh, just like your your guys' ability to read people and interactions and, and as that grows throughout your career um you know some some people that you interact with are probably pretty good at it too and if you're not confident then they're going to see yeah. that and and uh, i mean to me like the the street smart element of of human beings <clears throat> i think ha has an ability to 
to read that, you know, 100%. kind of no matter how old you are or, or what your experience is. But hundred <clears throat> percent. Uh, and it doesn't, you don't even have to be a, a tough bad guy to do that. I mean, yeah. so one of the ones that sticks out in my brain is we had an officer that worked for us. He's six, seven, you know, he's, he's a big boy. And, and uh, we had a, a young lady arrested and she was in the hospital and waiting for x-ray and he changed out the other officer. So he come in to swap out. And she said the moment he walked through the door, she sized him up. Even though he's the biggest guy there. Yeah. She instantly said, okay, I got him. So oh, shit. Next thing you know, he's she's got her cuffs in a spot that she wants them from him. And oh, shit. Went to the bathroom. And wow. next thing you know, she's out the door. So, I mean, it's Man, that's wild. It's just instantly, you know, here's a 20-year-old girl that yeah. sized up a six-foot-seven man. said, I got him. Do, has, has he heard the end of that? <laughs> he uh, does not work with us yeah, anymore. <laughs> I got you. Was that, was that the catalyst or that was just no, one? It of, was just one of them. Yeah. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Uh, is there a bust that you're most proud of? Well, probably uh, just being, we had a very large drug organization going on, and uh, it was back several years back, and it's one of the top ones in the eastern part of the United States at the time, not because we are a big agency, but we're centrally located four hours, Charlotte, four hours to yeah. Lexington, you know, four hours to everything. And so um, I was part of that group that got to go in and you know it was, it was a multi-million dollar operation and oh wow huge amounts of dope coming in a day and so i had a dog at the time so i was assigned to several houses and so that that's one probably that sticks in that's that's the most yeah you know, rewarding for everybody yeah. yeah uh when you say dope i mean was it was it marijuana or was there back back then it was uh, marijuana and cocaine yeah. I and mean, that was our thing <clears throat> crack cocaine um yeah but even today, we we don't. It's coming back. It is coming back. Right before I left, we started to see it again, but it's not a uh, it's not the drug of choice no more. It's either heroin or methamphetamine in our yeah. city. So, would you would you say that? Um, I guess percentage per capita wise from back in the heyday with uh, cocaine and marijuana that the heroin and meth replacement has increased. Yes, like it like percentage wise, yes. it has. Either. Yeah, it's a. Uh, in fact, it's it's. Like when heroin come in, we didn't have heroin for the longest time, and then it just moved in and just took over. I mean, it was, and now, you know, it's nothing for, you know, a weekend to have five overdoses. You know, wow. they might they might not die all die, but you know, you're going from call to call, yeah. the same thing. They're narcanning them and bringing them. Back. <clears throat> Are you guys seeing a, a huge increase uh, with things laced with fentanyl that people don't realize yes. that are too? So most of it comes it's it's mixed with something. So, yeah. and that's usually where our overdose comes in because they're used to hey i use this amount of heroin i'm good yeah and all of a sudden they're not yeah so. uh, you know i don't know do you guys get into the kind of the i don't know if you'd even call it a nuance but the, i guess the the specifics or the particulars of of this whole lacing thing you, you hear a lot about it um i don't know much about it I, you know i've listened to a number sean ryan's had a lot of really good episodes on that have kind of explored the the mexican cartel angle but <clears throat> I'm curious, um, like it seems as a businessman counterintuitive to put a lethal product into an existing product for your customers. I'm curious, if, do you guys get that far into it or you're just we, out there kind of yeah, battling it? Yeah, we're just kind of battling yeah. it. And I, 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 you know, I have a theory that uh, they're hoping that there's enough in there that it doesn't kill them, but enough to where it addicts them a little stronger. And so, yeah. but usually it's, Blows their hair back, and they're like, "This is the best shit I've yep, ever." Yeah, exactly. Yep. yep. Um, <clears throat> if you were to compare the the type of criminal or the type of crime that that was taking place back when it was um, <clears throat> marijuana and, and cocaine versus now, do you see a kind of an influx in severity or magnitude of crime that's taking place? With sure, with sure. Um, you know, back was marijuana cocaine i mean it's still there was crime to get it you know if you're a crack addict you're gonna have to have it but um with the crystal meth and the 
the heroin, it just seems like it's so more intense. Yeah. That they have to do so much more to get it that they're willing to do whatever it takes to get it. Yeah. So um, I, I think all our crime raises up. Yeah. You know, you can basically, from 20 years ago, you'd work on night shift, you wouldn't see anybody out. And now you walk, to, you know, you drive down the road and they're all over. Wow. You know, they're walking everywhere and you got to just wonder, okay, what are they breaking into? What are they getting ready to do? Because yeah. that's all they do all night is look for the next opportunity to, Wow. to get what they need so. is there almost like a walking dead feeling of it is we no actually shit. joke about that you really know, it's just like we call them the walking dead because wow. sometimes it's just they wander and really got a whole, no purpose so yeah that's got to be tough i mean uh my hat's off to you guys and, and all law enforcement for just you know the the shit that you guys put up with i mean i it, it seems like such a thankless job and but such a necessary one i mean for for people that uh you know don't think that police officers should be a thing or, or to defund law enforcement. I I'm, I'm baffled by that. You know, right. like it, I mean, to me, it's the, it's the one, I mean, you, you hear the, the thin blue line and you see, you know, the bumper stickers and the shirts and the flags and everything, but it's, it's there for a reason. I mean, the, you know, you guys are, are the one really gatekeeper or last line of defense between total fucking chaos and, and everybody else. And I mean, to me, like, I don't, I don't want to live in an environment where, if shit hits the fan, like, yes, I'm, I'm going to do what I'm going to do in the middle of the night, but I sure as fuck don't want to live in a society where <clears throat> calling people that, that are there to respond isn't an option. Right. You know, like that, to me, that's fucking yeah. frightening. It, it, it's always baffled me that the, even the, the ideology of that yeah. is just, and, and the good thing about it is it happened and now they see that it was probably terribly wrong Yeah, because the cities that did do it are now oh, it's trying to backpedal, yeah. you know, to catch back up, to get police and nobody wants to go work there. Yeah. I, I mean, have, have you guys in your area seen a, a decrease in support or uh, or a difficulty in bringing people on? Yeah, the support is not, It's we've not seen a huge decrease in our support. Our, our city's pretty proactive police. They, they like, yeah. you know, they you always have an element of the yeah. city. But um, as far as recruiting, it's been terrible. Yeah. Uh, and it's not, uh, we're not the only ones. It's everybody around us. Yeah. So nobody wants to, you know, why are you going to go? Half the guys got bachelor's and master's degrees. Why are you going to go work for $35,000 a year? Yeah. God damn, is that what the starting pay is? Yeah, so now we actually raised it up, but you know, up until last year, we're at $35,000. Wow. It, I'm assuming cost of living-wise, it's tough to make it even it in is. that area. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and is that not fixable from a tax revenue standpoint? It is fixable, and I think it's it's going to happen. It's yeah. got to happen because most cities around us, um, the same thing. They're yeah. They're seeing the problem, and... And I told the guys when I left, I said, listen, you're in a good spot because they'll have to raise it because they just don't have anybody else coming aboard. Yeah. You know? Is there, uh, with, within the, the entire department, is a six-figure salary a- attainable for a number of guys, or is it like? Close. You, yeah. you can if you move up, say, like, in, in, <clears throat> I was a captain before I left, and so you can you can just about attain that six-figure yeah. mark. But that's after 30 years. and. Yeah. You know, in between that thirty years, you gotta yeah. raise a family on thirty or forty thousand a year. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, it, man, I can only imagine. Um, w- w- both when you were active uh, and now, what what was your morning routine? Well, I would, since I had my business, I would basically get up about four o'clock in the morning, three thirty in the morning, and I'd go out and do kennel stuff, and go and get ready to go to work, and work twelve hours, and then come home and. Work another six, seven hours at the kennel and go to bed about midnight and start all over. Yeah, that's pretty seven much days a week. seven days a week. So wow. Even if I didn't have to work at the police department, then I would have to double up on that in days to catch up with what yeah. what I needed to do. Yeah. You know? So was Integrity Canine, were you doing um, all different types of stuff or was it primarily police canine kind of stuff? Or at what? first, that's, what, that's pretty much what I did. Yeah. Um, but I didn't do it a ton to, so, to make a living, so to speak. Yeah. I just did it here and there and... Just in the police world, you know, these people start saying, hey, can you get me a dog? Can you find me a dog? So, but as the time went on, you know, pet dogs is a big business. Yeah. And so over the last several years, we did pet dogs. And that's that's pretty much our main supply of money. But we still do several dogs a year. Yeah. Um, we don't do a ton of them just because we don't want to rack out just anything. So yeah. if we get one, then it, we're going to tell them it's going to take five or six months for us to complete it for them. And yeah. they're okay with it. If they're not, they have to go somewhere else. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know that feeling for yeah. sure. Um, and so your morning routine now, is it kind of the same? It just it all 
It is about the same. So now it's five o'clock instead of three thirty. <laughs> <laughs> Taking it easy. Yeah, and then uh, usually now since we tired, so I've added more dogs. You know, of course. So the routine's the same. I mean, it's usually eleven thirty, twelve before I'm done. And, yeah. You know, fi- get the final cleaning in the kennel and then off. Yeah. So. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, The hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him, and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bub's brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing. Uh, it mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint from a joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as, as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and, uh, be able to, to work with them and, and sponsor a product that, uh, number one is a high quality product. And number two is, is so near and dear to, uh, you know, to my heart and to the mic drop podcast for, for who it, uh, was started for and what it stands for, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place to be. So um, it is Whole30 approved. Um, it's uh, sport certified, so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're they're offering uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and uh, use the mic drop code. So uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out incorporated into your day day to day for joint health for brain health uh, for cognition for gut health and uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things uh, in glenn bubs honor so uh, go to bubsnaturals.com mic drop is the code 20 percent off are you uh, are you originally from that area so i'm originally from upstate new york really uh, right outside between <coughs> Ro- rochester and buffalo right on lake ontario so yeah i moved down with my parents when i was 16. Oh, okay. So, so that, that first 16 years you spent in upstate New York? Yes. Um, what was that like growing up there? Well, surprisingly, like most people think when they hear New York that it's city, it's it's actually more country than what I live in now. Yeah, I mean, wow. We lived on the Lake Ontario, and, you know, the closest neighbor was half a mile away, and, yeah. you know, we grew up on the on the lake or the river, so we just had a good childhood. Yeah. You know, dirt biking. And, yeah. So, uh, siblings? Yep, I have an older brother and younger brother. Oh, okay. So the middle middle brother, did you get fucked with a lot? Or did you get forgotten? Yeah. You're not the oldest, yeah. you're not the baby. Yeah. So my yeah. oldest got all the, uh, you know, he, he was the trial and error kid. Yeah. You know what I mean, or the, the first to do yeah. everything. Right. You know, make him re- wear rubber boots to school until yeah. he was bullied, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then my younger brother got, you know, whatever he wanted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're the bastard, bastard yeah. kid. Did you uh, play any sports? Uh, played soccer. Soccer. Yep. Was that a, a big thing in the, in that area at the time? Yeah, up north, pretty much like in our school, we didn't even have a football team. Really? It was, it was soccer only. It was the main. It's that's not wild. that it's not that other schools didn't. It's just that yeah, that's what, that's what the that sport we thing. did. Yeah. That in baseball. Yeah. Um, it, throughout high school, was there kind of a, a catalyst or a, a turning point where you decided you wanted to, to go into law enforcement? <clears throat> yep. So I had several of my buddies in school that kind of wanted to do it, and we kicked the idea around, and then. Um, of course, I got moved. You know, when I moved down here, I thought, "Well, what am I going to do?" And then I actually went to college to be an accountant. And really? So, but I always, in the back of my mind, wanted to do law enforcement. So halfway through college, I 
made that great uh, switch <laughs> to, to law enforcement. It made my mom and dad really proud. And <laughs> yeah, was there? I mean, was there? What was the reason for it? Like, what? I couldn't. Uh, I just couldn't take the monotony boredom of it. Yeah. And so I just, I always in the back of my mind wanted to do law enforcement, um, and I just finally said, I'm just going to do it. Was that more inexplicable uh, as to why you wanted to do law enforcement? Was it just some some draw that you had to it, or was there something behind it? No, it was just something I, I wanted to do. Yeah. And uh, and then once I got into it, then I, I just really couldn't get out. Yeah. You know, I just, even now when you retire, you think, I'm done, I'm done. But you're always still. Still wanting to yeah, do Yeah, you're that. still wondering. And I'm still on the group text with the guys. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? I wonder what they're doing. And so it's, yeah. I think it, once it sticks in, it has to really. Yeah. Because if you're making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year, when yeah. you can go do something else and make a ton of money, then. Yeah, you're not doing it for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can imagine that's hard doing it for that long. I mean, the you know, I was in the military for twelve and almost thirteen years, and even in that amount of time, you know, it, it was a tough transition getting out. I mean, it, there's still parts of me that kind of have one sure. foot in me- mentally, at least. But um, <clears throat> so you did a couple years of college, and then you just, did you just bail and, and went right into? Yep. I, w- yeah. I went right in, so I switched over my major a little bit <clears throat> and ended up did getting a, um, a public safety degree, so to speak, and then. And I went straight into the yeah. academy and, and yeah. then went to work. And, then and so what uh, So what year time period did you go through the academy? Uh, 92. 92. 92 to 93, yeah. And uh, have, have there been points in your career since then that you've run the academy or been an instructor there? I have been instructing in yeah. the academy. Um, that was probably several years ago when I when I did that. And then uh, I just got, just got out because... You know, once once my career took off and I was doing this special assignment and that special assignment, I just didn't have time to yeah to do it. But was there uh, a huge disparity from when you went went through it versus when you were an instructor, or did you try to keep the uh, the gatekeeper mentality the same? It tried to keep it the same. I I feel like today's world, it's not. You know, I mean, like uh, you know, the things that we were required to do are not what they're required to do now, and it seems like it's it's easier, softer because. <clears throat> you know, just uh, the mentality of of what a policeman is now. Yeah. You know? So, unfortunately, I don't think it's – it's not that the caliber of some of them guys going in there don't want that. Yeah. It's just that it's, they're not, it's not given to them. Yeah. But luckily for us, one of the guys that used to work for our department is a, is a brilliant mind kid, and he actually took over the, the law enforcement academy for the region Yeah. Uh, last year. So, he oh, said he's going to make some big changes. And yeah. Well, that's good. How uh, How long was it? Uh, for us, it was, uh, when I took it, it was nine weeks. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's somewhere longer than others. And, um, but that's pretty much the standard in the, your basic academy, yeah. what you got to have to start off. You know, yeah. So. Um, so your first, uh, kind of assignment or, or position, what was that like? It was just patrol. Yeah. That was the greatest job ever. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what, what did you love so much about it? Well, just the freedom. I mean, just, uh, I mean, you were, you were basically, uh, in charge of the city, you know, yeah. when, the, when the lights kicked off at night, you were it. You and six other guys were, you were the gatekeepers, and yeah. so you know, we had a pretty proactive group of guys back then. And I mean, we, you know, we we go to work, yeah. so it was just a uh, fun. I mean, I, people say, "Well, I'd work for free," but I, I would have worked for free. I mean, it was yeah. that point, you know. And, and then, like everything, it's you know, change as you as you progress, but still, that's even after thirty years, it's still in my mind that. Yeah. When the yeah. guys say, hey, we're going to get ready to do this, I'm like, man. Yeah. Wish I was that. Do, do you look back at that time and, and think, like, God damn, I wish I could go back? Like, was that the, the yeah. best best it was, time? It was the best time. Uh, I feel like it was the best camaraderie. You yeah. know what I mean? When, so <clears throat> I think it's it's like that, not just in the law enforcement world, but every place that every man for themselves now. You know yeah. what I mean? You just don't have this. And back then, you know, you worked eight, ten hours and as soon as you got off, all eight guys are in somebody's house for the next three or four. You know, so <laughs> yeah. it's like you couldn't get enough of that yeah. that team group. And then, yeah. but now it's it seems like it just slowly slipped away. And I think it's just society in whole. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I see that. Uh, it's funny because the reason I ask is, it, you know, same for me. Like when I think back to when I was, you know, fuck, I was 19, 20 years old. Um, you know, as a brand new seal at SEAL Team Three, living in fucking Coronado in, in mm-hmm. an apartment single no kids like my only responsibility was me and my job right 
uh, you know, and at, at the time it was hectic and stressful and, you know, I took it serious. And so it was, it was a lot on my plate, but looking back on it, just like, God damn, man. Best. Yeah. Like being that age and doing that for a living and just, yeah. Like if I could, I wish I could go back and slap the fuck out of myself and be like, dude, it, enjoy this shit because it doesn't get any better than this. You I know? made <clears throat> when my check come, I made $579 every two weeks. And I thought I was a millionaire. Yeah. I thought, man. No, I mean, I was about in the same boat. I mean, it, yeah, it was, it was about that same amount, yeah. you know, and, uh, but yeah, just, uh, but yeah, the, the job and, and the guys you work with, whatever, it's, it's weird how, how life goes on. You have kids and all that. Yeah. Four daughters. <clears throat> oh man. <laughs> Hat, hats off to you on that one. Um, it, it, you know, to me that, that, that inherently changes you, you know, especially when you're doing something dangerous. Um, so, f- all right. So back to, uh, that, that kind of first time, were there instances where, um, so you said you and six other guys. Yeah, so usually on a shift we'd have like working with probably six and then a couple supervisors, which they were they were patrolmen too, you know, they were just the supervisor, but they're gonna answer calls with you and things yeah. and uh and then on Friday would be considered a power day, so we'd have maybe thirteen guys working the yeah. shift and uh but that was a general six to seven guys would be working say, yeah. on the night shift or whatever. How how big of a population is that covering? Oh, uh, we have about there's be 35 to 40,000 there. Yeah. Um, we have a large Hispanic population. So a lot of them are just, you know, they're not counted. Yeah. But they take up a, a large part of our city. It's a, so would you say it, it's closer to 50,000 population? Yeah. And we're an industrial city. So during the day or during any time you have, you know, over a hundred and something thousand in there yeah. because we have three industrial parks in the city. So it just, and everything around us comes there to work. So yeah. what is the main uh, industry or industries there? It used to be furniture, like a, and now it's uh, a little bit of everything. Uh, yeah. We have three separate industrial parks. So, is there any got, like big company manufacturing plants or anything there? Yeah, you know, like uh, we're getting a new one uh, to to do buses. To oh, do okay, for, like two buses, and uh, um, there's Molly things like that. Um, JTEC thing and big things that make cardboards. Yeah, and things like that. So yeah, there's there's quite a few industries in there. Yeah, uh, and that so that so you see got. Anywhere from six to thirteen guys covering anywhere from forty thousand to a hundred thousand. What was a, an average number of calls that you would go on in a, in a shift? Uh, it, it just depends. I mean, uh, how hot you were. We would average um, forty to fifty thousand a year. So you can kind of, wow. you know, so and <clears throat> so really a lot. a lot. You know, you answered a bunch of calls, but for us, we we enjoyed it because it kept us busy and yeah, you know, we were go getters. And so was there a, a top three? calls that, that that you came on to or is it just a fucking smorgasbord of everything yeah it's just uh a little bit of everything i mean it was just like uh you know one day it'd be utter boredom and the next day it'd be like you know, yeah this is the greatest you know? <laughs> <laughs> what uh what are some wild ones that uh, that came down the so like? so not in canine um so there's one that sets back in the day i was i was a patrolman and uh i was doing a track or i was getting ready to do a traffic stop and of course, he didn't stop, so he took off. And back then, we could pursue. We could do pretty much whatever we wanted. You know, there Pit wasn't, maneuvers into a fucking uh, yeah, playground. Just whatever we want to do, you know. <laughs> so um, we had rules, but they nothing like what they are. You know, now there's the case law changes everything. But uh, I can remember finally getting in the pursuit. He gets to his house, and he bails out, and he pulls a knife. And so here I am by myself. I pull my gun. And I'm thinking, okay, what are we going to do? Well, what were you carrying gun wise? Um, back then, it was a Smith & Wesson 10 millimeter. <clears throat> and so... Uh, an anchor. I mean, a huge, yeah. huge. <laughs> fucking stop sign. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I didn't know at the time that I'd actually passed his brother during the pursuit. So oh, okay. his brother fell in the pursuit. So um, long story short, he ends up throwing the knife down. We get into it fight and uh, we're fighting there quite a while. By then I don't have any vest on, no shirt on, no gun belt on. It's, it's off. And next thing I know, I'm on the second story of this building and, uh, I've got two 220 pound guys. Holy shit. Beating me to death. And so I kick one off the porch thinking, well, this will work. You know, he goes off two stories. Sure. He's going to stay Holy down shit. there. But he come back up. God yeah. damn. And then, so instead of using the key, they used me to open the door. So they Holy put shit. me through the door and then, uh, then we end up going through the glass table. <laughs> Holy <laughs> fuck. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, at this point, like, are you, uh, like fighting for your life feeling. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's. I have no, you know, I have no gun, <clears throat> nothing. Where did, so your gun just it's it's laying out there in the yard somewhere. Holy shit! So, 
Uh, so at this time, I'm thinking, oh, man, this is going to hurt. You know, this is yeah. bad. But just a few seconds later, guys showed up and took care of things for me. And, yeah. But, you know, that's the difference between now and then. Like, now I'd be like, I don't do that no more. Yeah. Back then, it was like, yeah, that's it, great. Like, for, for you personally or because of the response? It, 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 it was both. I think, yeah. I think just because, uh, they, you know, they showed up and everything worked out for the yeah. best for us. And, uh, you know, when it was all said and done, I wasn't too hurt, too bad. And I thought, yeah. man, I can't go back to work tomorrow. Yeah. That's going to be awesome. I'm sure some of that is an age thing, right? It is an age yeah. thing. Because yeah. right now I'd be like, I'm not, yeah. I don't want to do that. No, no I know it. I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, by the response thing, I, what I meant by that was the, the response of the, of the other officers. Is there a difference now with the guys showing up of you counting on them or response no, time? No, or it, it, even, um, even though I don't feel like the uh, complete camaraderie is the same you know it's not that there isn't some you know some shifts are still full of young guys that yeah. you know they're still all together and then others you know get older and even though they've been with each other forever <clears throat> and they'll, they'll do anything for each other you know they got lives on their own and yeah but as far as working i, I don't i don't care if you don't even like the guy next to you you're, yeah if he yeah. calls for help you're coming sure you know, yeah so yeah same same thing in the military there's yeah. guys that you can't can't get along with very sure. well or can't fucking stand it you know but you go to war with them and right you can count on them and you do it and whatever um I'm, I'm curious that so when he had the knife uh the fact that he threw it down now you couldn't right so is that um you know pretty much you got to assess the threat you can't go back of what was it's, yeah. it's pretty much what's happening now so yeah. um once he threw it down you threw your gun and yeah, I threw it and I said, let's go. But it, no. so back yeah. then we had holsters that, you know, the gun might stay in it. Might, oh, wow. Might not. Yeah. You know, we didn't have no safety level holsters yeah. back then. And uh, so, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I barely got it in and got it snapped and the fight was yeah. on. So, yeah. but it ended up somewhere else. I don't know. Where yeah. And back then, I mean, did you even have tasers? No, yeah. had no tasers, no yeah. pepper gas. No, that was pretty much a gun, handcuffs and the radio. You know? No uh, baton or nightstick or anything? We, we did have a baton, but nine times out of 10, it was, is in the car yeah yeah so was it the collapsible one or the fuck it was the full yeah. it was the full and that's why it's in the car yeah yeah exactly one thing i know um for most of the hard chargers out there that uh drink a lot of coffee uh, throughout the day is that one of the problems is anxiety jitters or that crash in the afternoon from drinking it um so that's why i started working with mud water um it's a coffee alternative with four ap- adaptogenic mushrooms uh, and herbs. It's got a fraction of the caffeine of a cup of coffee. So you get that same uh, kind of energy boost and, and mental clarity without those jitters and anxiety and, and crash that you do with coffee. Uh, each ingredient was added for a purpose. It's got cacao and chai for mood and a microdose of caffeine. It's got lion's mane for alertness, uh, cordyceps to help support physical performance, chaga and reishi to support your immune system. It's got turmeric for soreness. Uh, and it's got cinnamon for antioxidants. Uh, it tastes great um, from a favorite ingredient standpoint. Uh, I'm a big fan of the lion's mane for alertness. Uh, you know, my day is, is pretty busy, uh, and I have a lot to pay attention to and, and keep track of, and so that helps me out a lot. But uh, but again, there's there's a host of, of beneficial ingredients. Um, I actually like to throw a, a little bit of monk fruit uh, vanilla drops uh, with just a little bit of uh, heavy cream. And it gives me that kind of uh, vanilla latte esque flavor to it. Uh, Mud water is Whole 30 approved. It's 100% USDA organic, non GMO, gluten free, vegan, and kosher certified. Uh, and one of the big things that I love about this company is that they donate monthly to the Berkeley Center for Science of Psychedelics, as Mud water believes the country is in a mental health epidemic and sees psychedelics as useful tools for individuals with depression, PTSD, anxiety, and other health, uh, mental health problems. Uh, that really strikes a chord with me as, as I see a lot of veteran communities that have benefited greatly from uh, projects such as the Berkeley Center. So um, right now, Mudwater, which is M-U-D-W-T-R.com forward slash Mike to support both my show and use the code Mike for 15% off your order uh, at Mudwater. So again, that's Mudwater, M-U-D-W-T-R dot com forward slash Mike and use uh, just Mike, all caps, M-I-K-E for 15% off your total order and uh, try these amazing uh, products out. We did go to uh, an optional that you could use a collapsible. So 
at one point I went on a bicycle patrol. So oh, really? I, I stayed on there about four years. So I, I had a collapsible one there. Yeah. So, so I'm curious about that. Um, when you went on that, I mean, let's say you said you were four, it was four years. Yeah. Did you get in way better shape being on that? Man, it was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. We, we ride 40 to 50 miles a day. Holy shit. And so, you know, we got full gear on, yeah. but uh, we just were in way better shape. And then yeah. the dynamics of the city, how it was laid out, like the inner part of the city or whatever, you know, it'd be nothing for us to beat a patrol car to every call. No just, shit. just because, you know, they got to yeah. stop here and stop there and we yeah. can cut through and, yeah. and uh, we'd work night shift and go to every club we could and hide out. And yeah. for the first year and a half, they really couldn't understand that we had bike patrols. So they didn't, they weren't looking for two guys on bicycles. Yeah. You know, so, um, your, your dick, did you get used to your dick going numb all day? Man. I mean, cause that, like, after a while, like the first, like the first six months I was on that bike, I thought, what am I doing? Yeah, I'm, not, I'm never going to have kids. Yeah. This is ridiculous. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden, you know, it got, I don't know if it just went numb or I just couldn't <laughs> feel it no more, but you know, it just, uh, yeah. it went away. So, yeah. um, you guys, any type of like healthy competition, uh, bike cop guy, like, like were you racing or fucking oh, yeah. anything? So like the that? other guy that was on bike with me. He, he I actually graduated with, with him at high school. So we'd known each other and he was, he was a lot better shape than I was. We were about the same build, but he yeah. was just an athletic kid. And so yeah. he, we'd always constantly, yeah. yeah, I bet you I can beat you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm th- thinking about it like the, I mean, the, the bike cop thing seems like a, a really smart idea in, in those urban environments, but I also, I mean, to me, similarly, like a, a dirt bike, like a, a modest dirt bike, a smaller, you know, mm-hmm. light, agile dirt bike would make a lot of sense too for, for that same reason. Like that, you're fucking beating everybody. Yeah. You know, like a little enduro or, or something like mm-hmm. that. I mean, <clears throat> I'm surprised why they don't have that. I mean, obviously there's motorcycle cops, but but they're on big fucking you know yep, Goldwing exactly. kind of cruisers. I mean, it, uh, is that something that has ever been brought up? Never. Or, yeah, never. I don't even think it's on people's <clears throat> mind. I think it, you know it's either one extreme or the other. Yeah. You know? So one thing I was surprised I was in D.C. back uh, around the holidays, and uh, there was you know the the police presence. I I think per capita is by far the highest in D.C. because you got you know Capitol Police, you got federal. Secret Service, you got, I mean, there's fucking right. cops everywhere there. And, uh, but there were like these hood rat fucking gangs of, of guys running around on four wheelers and dirt oh, bikes yeah. and, and like wheeling through parks. And, and like th- they'd be in a big group of like fucking 25 or 30 of them wheeling, like taking over the entire fucking street and they wouldn't do anything about it. No, I was really surprised. I was like, you know, like they're yelling at people for, you know, walking somewhere where they're not supposed to walk and like, you know, almost arresting them for <laughs> like, you know, walking through a piece, a piece of the yard of some Capitol building right. that they're not supposed to be on. And then there's these dudes that are just like terrorizing the neighborhood. They're like, now nah, we, we have a standing order not to chase them. Do you know what? Well, yeah, it's, a, it's all, it's all due to case law. Basically yeah. it's all, you know, like back in the day, nobody had, with no liability, you know. What yeah. I mean? Hey, if you did something wrong, it's your fault. Yeah. Now everybody's it's everybody else's fault but their own. So yeah, pretty much most departments have a very limited pursuit policy, and it really has to be more. The severity of the pursuit has to outweigh even the crime. You know, what I mean, it has yeah. to. So it, it's very difficult. You know, it's murder, things like that. Other yeah. than that, you're just not going to do it. It's wow. just not. Yeah. You know. No, I mean, I guess I guess it makes sense. I get it. I just. uh it's weird to see, you know, that yeah. it's like they're not almost, I mean, like they were clearly like mocking and sure. like trying to fuck with them, you know, and it's just like, man, what the fuck? Who are these idiots? Yeah. You know, but yeah, and like it, it pissed me off seeing them get away sure, with it, you know, sure. but and it, I'm sure it did the police too, but yeah. it was probably, you know, yeah, no, I, I guess they chase them and they run over fucking kids across yeah. the street or something. And then yeah. it's the cop's fault. And, sure it uh, is. and then yeah. he's got to live with it too. So yeah. no, I, that makes yeah. sense. Um, all right. So how long were you in the, in the patrol, uh, sector section for? So basically I was in patrol my whole career. So we have, um, which is rare, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, so I wanted to stay in patrol. I had opportunities to move to back division or things like that, but, uh, I, I, I did not like the inside. Same reason I didn't want to be an accountant. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't want to sit in an office and I want to be out and do what I, I want to do. So, um, I stayed in it. I worked patrol for a few years and then went to bike patrol for a few years and then I went back to patrol just straight patrolman for a few years and then I went into canine after that so and then from canine I was promoted and 
I was in charge of canine, but I was also in charge of a shift. So I did both of those. And then I had a dog all the way up till basically I retired. So yeah. I had four dogs in between that. So oh, wow. So your, uh, your first dog, uh, what was that experience like? My first dog was so the city itself had never had a dual purpose dog. They had single purpose dogs, but never dual purpose dogs. So single purpose detector. I yep, yeah. yep. Narcotic only detector dogs. So, um, me and another guy were the first ones to get dual purpose dogs and you know, we didn't know what we we're doing. Yeah. You know, it was just like, <laughs> you know, when I was getting a new dog, I was getting my first dog and, and the vendor that we got it from pulled up in the, in my driveway. And uh, when I looked out, I noticed the leash was sticking out the car door. He reached and grabbed the car door and <clears throat> opened the door and the dog's in a muzzle. And he's like, there you go. And wow. that was our introduction. Holy so shit. it was like, Oh my gosh. And, so you didn't go through a handler course? So shortly after we did, um, but it wasn't even a traditional like we do now. Yeah. You know, it was, it was like, here's what we do, and we'll meet on Wednesday maybe and go over something. So yeah. me and another guy pretty much, we'd work all day, and then we'd spend the next eight, nine hours training together, trying to figure out the system. And then um, we did have a guy that did regular training with us, but uh, a brilliant dog trainer, but just not not a good uh personal life so we had yeah. to move him and pretty much from there it was trial and error and then later on i ended up going to a, a training school and different things and just just learning the huff, tough way and then yeah so then we did the, uh, do you remember the very first call that you went on with your first dog so i remember the first uh traffic stop with finding narcotics and i remember my first dog bite yeah you know, with it so let's, let's hear that so the first so the first uh Narcotic was basically, uh, I, I saw a guy that I knew uh, that was. Oh, you already knew him. I, I, I knew this guy was probably into dope. So I pull him over and run the cycle and run the dog. <laughs> and so my first the first deployment, it's the first time they have dual purpose dogs. Uh, not only does my dog indicate on the car for narcotics, but then he tries to jump through the window to get the guy. Oh, no so, shit. Yeah. So. <laughs> So I tear the side of this guy's car. I was the first traffic stop ever. We got to repaint this guy's car. So. Oh, man. Was, were there narcotics? <laughs> there in was it? narcotics in it. And, Did, uh, oh, sorry. Go and ahead. usually, usually that is uh, like nowadays. You know, if dog scratches the car up and it's got narcotics in it, stuff like yeah. You know? But I think that was its first. Like, oh my gosh, what do we do? Yeah. You know, we've never had this situation. So. Like air on the side of sure, liability. Sure. Yeah. So we we painted like a 1985 Camaro. <laughs> <laughs> had, had you know had enough rust on it to you know what I'm saying? Yeah. um I, you know, I'm curious about that the uh like from a a liability standpoint i guess the on the narcotic side um <clears throat> when was the shift and, and now is it that way i mean you said it, it's tough luck is, is there a limit to where you know if, if they've broken the law or they they have narcotics or it's a situation where the the guy needs to get bit i mean is is that kind of almost a liability waiver for you guys where okay you broke the law and so all this shit is just it's your own fucking problem yes to a certain point you know like of course with biting it's um, you got a list of rules and regulations you got to go by and there's federal standards for that and so we go by that and our city's pretty much uh you know, we've had dual purpose dogs for 22 years and by the good Lord, we've never been sued. We have been yeah. sued by one policeman. That, really? Yeah. They got dog bit that had a dog and oh, was coming wow. to training with us and things happened. And How the fuck is that even possible? Exactly. But, uh, it happened. And so, Jesus. but that's the only time we've ever been sued. And we, and we, we, we say that because we find a lot of people, we yeah. do a lot of good, cool stuff, but, uh, we give ample opportunity for them to give up. As long as we're safe and we can give them time to think about it, we'll yeah. give them time to think about it. Because if we get them, and I don't have to worry about what's going on down the, the pipe from federal court in a, in a year, yeah. that's great. So yeah. It's just cleaner. So. Yeah. Um, do you remember what uh, what and how much he had in the, in the vehicle? Uh, it, it, it ended up being just marijuana yeah. at the time, but it was a little tiny bag of it. But yeah. still, at the, that was my first. I was like, yes, it's awesome. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've got it. Yeah. I'm, I'm stopping the drug crime. You yeah. know, and it's over here in yeah. the city. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> fucking batman yeah i mean i'm, I'm here you know, yeah. me and my dog are here yeah so. today's episode is sponsored by true classic t-shirts um i want to say that you know finding a a t-shirt that actually fits worth a damn can be a challenge sometimes um on top of that you know whether they don't fit in the right place or you know if you're in shape or or not in shape is that they 
they almost always feel like they're built for somebody else. Uh, True Classic uh, has sun and, and sweat wicking technology as well as anti-BO properties uh, in their shirts. So they fit really well. Uh, they don't sag or um, you know get bundled up in the wrong places uh, as well as wicking sweat away and, and help you from uh, stinking up the place. Um, they're, they're a great company that uh, right now is offering 25% off if you go to trueclassic.com and uh, the code is mic drop. To support the Mic Drop Show, get yourself some great T-shirts that fit well, uh, you know, as well as a, a host of other products. They don't just do T-shirts; they do uh, polos, they do boxer briefs, um, workout shirts, things of that nature. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for uh, good, affordable apparel that uh, you know is going to help you out in terms of how it fits, and uh, and also at the gym and and uh, all aspects of your wardrobe. So again, go to trueclassic.com. For twenty five percent off when you enter the code mic drop. So then the uh, the first the first bite with him. So right? my like first it. apprehension with him. Um, so I was watching a club one night and uh, I did try to stop on a guy and uh, so I was all by myself and and I had a what we call CPA rider. So it's a Citizens Police Academy. So we once a year we put on a police academy for citizens. They come in. They go through a bunch of classes, they learn, they get to ride. And it's just kind of a PR thing for the public to help them understand what we do. And so he was actually riding with me that night. And so I pulled the guy over and end up getting him out, do a pat down, and I end up finding like 18 bags of weed on him. So On him? Yeah, so he had it lined up in his sweatpants. He was oh, dealing wow. at a club, and so he had it lined up. So um, I was by myself at the time and was waiting for backup to come, but I knew he was getting – antsy so i tried to put the handcuff on him and the fight was on so he he takes off running and uh i'm chasing him and we have a remote door opener so i hit the remote and here he comes so the dog goes down engages him and the guy says i give up i give up i give up so i call the dog off which was rare for this dog to come off you know so i thought i'd try it and it worked i thought yeah. wow it's awesome yeah. yeah so he comes off <clears throat> and i go up to do up to grab him and when i grab him to do a little sweep to get him down he comes up and just clocks me. So I'm I'm seeing stars. I, I can barely see what I'm doing. The and the guy the bad guy. So oh, the bad no guys, shit. Yeah. So now he's engaged me. So when I kind of come to my senses, I look up and probably fifty feet away, he's he's got my dog picked up because the dog is now reattached to him, you know, re engaged him. And he picked him up like he's done bite work his entire life. He swung him up, put him on his shoulder, and off he went. No shit. And so he's running down the street. I'm kind of sideways thinking, where am I at? What am I doing? Holy fuck. And there's my dog. His tail is just ding, 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 ding. He's <laughs> thinking, this is great. You know, this is This great. is all part of the yeah, game. Yeah, this is beautiful. And God so, damn. so during the, I finally caught up to him. And, uh, but in between that, uh, before I caught him, you know, the guy, I don't know if he watched on you. I don't know what he did, but he knew how he, he basically took that dog and slammed him into the concrete and the curve and tried to get him off. When he didn't, he just spin him back up. So he could hold them correctly. So he, you know, and yeah. then he'd run them down again and slam them again. And Jesus. So in between that time of, by the time I caught up to him and got him finally down to the ground, you know, of course the dog had latched on and it just basically opened him from here all the way here, you know, from swinging him. And so he finally gave up and I ended up getting him cuffed and God damn. Know, but he, you know, he was just like, well, no big yeah. deal. He, he'd been out of prison 18 days. So it was no big deal to him. He just, Fuck me. Yeah. So I'm curious. I mean, if putting myself in your shoes, that, that would be dicey to, to to determine, especially in that situation, how you go about. So, okay, you, you catch him, but, like, you don't want to tackle him because right. the dog's on, on his on, shoulders. On his shoulders, So yeah. how, how did you? So I, I end up catching up to him and grabbing a hold and trying to slow him down a little bit, and he actually, boom, tripped over the curve. But at the time, the, the little dog I had was a, he's a 60-pound Malawam. And just a bad little dude, you know. He a tough just, motherfucker. Yeah, he just a, he's just he's just a tough dude, and he was gashed open on his leg, and but Didn't you know he fuck. just enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, it was part of the game to him. So I knew pretty much at this point the dog's not going to come off because of what I watched him do. Yeah. Um, so when we got down the ground, I really kind of forgot the dog was even on. You know, you get in tunnel vision, and I got him handcuffed, and then got the other one cuffed, and realized my dog's still attached to him. You know, but uh, yeah, uh, it was an eye open experience though, so much as because. You know, we were kind of left to ourselves to figure out the game. We, you know, we we got dogs and went through a little class, but I mean, really. So this was in the nineties. So this would be the first two thousand. Okay, two thousand. So, um, you know, we 
we <clears throat> we trained the best we knew how to train. Yeah. But, you know, it was go down, bite a guy in a bite suit. That's a good boy. And then yeah. go get him off and take him to the car. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or fire him back up. But, and, yeah. and this is the first time, you know, the dog engages. Yeah. And I look up and the guy's picking my dog off and he's yeah. running off. I'm thinking, I, nobody's yeah. ever told me that's going to happen. Like, yeah. It can't happen. Yeah. For, yeah, I mean, for a first real live bite, that's about as challenging of a scenario yeah. as, as exists. You know, I mean, to me, it sounds like you got a, a banger of a first dog, too. Yeah, I did. I got lucky, <clears throat> you know, and uh, it, well, he was a challenge. It was an everyday experience. Like, you know, you open the car door and it looked like, well, oh, gosh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, here it comes. But, yeah. but did he take a shot at the title? Yeah. A he, bunch of times. A bunch of times. Yeah. You know, it was always like that. And, but that's just who he was. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, I end up having to transfer him to another guy later on, and uh, I knew it was coming. So, for the enjoyment, you know, I put a muzzle on him and handed it to him and went down the road. And I said, "I'm going to separate." There was another trainer, and I said, "I'm going to separate." And I just waited and I looked, and a few <laughs> seconds, he's going to climb up this guy's back, and he did. So, I mean, <laughs> man, but he was a great little dog. I mean, yeah. he, what was his name? Uh, Rico. Rico. Yeah, he did. He did some cool stuff. He man. was a dog. How uh, how long did you have him? So I had him a couple of years, and then uh, the other handle I had him, gosh, I'm going to say six. He was probably 10 when we retired him, wow. um, 10 or 11 when we retired him, and he lived probably to 13 and a half. And then, yeah. Um, so that was the first scenario. How many uh, bites did you get with him? He had, I think he had nine bites all altogether. Um, I only had uh, another one with him before I transferred him over, and then um, the other guy was pretty active with him. Yeah. So what he, was the other bite like? Uh, so the other one, let's see, I'm trying to think what the, what, what one was him was, uh, so we had, uh, okay. So the, his next bite, his Bex night would be a guy broke into a, um, uh, uh, an auto parts place. And so he was hiding up on the, and that's actually in transition time. So the guy that had him was actually using him that day or trying to, trying to transition so uh we get a call that he's in there the guy goes in um he's up on top of a shelf and he's picked the cat up in in this there's a cat inside this auto parts store like and, a feline cat yeah so he's picked the cat up and he's gonna because he not here's the announcement so he's gonna use the cat as bait <laughs> holy fuck <laughs> jesus christ so the dog goes in there finds him and he takes the cat and throws it on the dog and luckily you know the dog just didn't care and yeah and, and let go and went up the Went up the shelves to get him. Yeah. And he's a big old boy. And, you know, I just, I'm glad he just gave up because I'm not sure we would could have handled him. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, he's a, just a big monster man. So. Yeah. Fuck so. Christ. Did you ever shoot anybody? When, no. 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 <clears throat> um, all right. So two bites with him. You transferred him. What was the reason for transferring the dog and then so getting it done? I was going to get, uh, I was getting promoted at the time. And so uh, the original, the original uh, deal was I was going to get promoted and just run a canine unit and uh, be in charge of that. And somebody else got promoted and it didn't work out. And so at the time, the chief's kind of like, hey, will you go back to patrol for a little while? And I thought, well, yeah, I will, but I don't want this dog to go to waste. You know, I want somebody that's going to yeah. actively work him. So um, I switched him to him. And then shortly after, I got a dual-purpose uh, bomb dog, which is easier to work when you're a supervisor. You, know, yeah. you don't have to make as many stops and things yeah. like that. So I switched over to an, an EOD dog and I kept that really until I yeah. kept an EOD dog until my career ended. So. Yeah. Um, what type of stuff are you doing with that dog? Is it like, like low level city stuff or like any time bigger shit happens or both? Or, both. Yeah. So at the time when we got our first one, uh, <clears throat> nobody else had an EOD dog. Well, Knoxville, Knoxville, uh, Knox County, Knox city did, but anything East, we pretty much had to take care of it. So yeah, you know, we'd get called to the next county or the next city. You know, usually bomb threats or if if the ATF or the FBI wanted something close in that region, they'd call us. But yeah, a lot of it was you know we got a a bomb threat here or a bomb threat in this school or that school or yeah, we did a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, in your entire career, did you ever find any explosive material? So I you? never never found any live bomb. We we have some from we have another <laughs> we had another EOD dog at the same time. And uh, he had some pretty nice live find at one location. Really? Um, so on that case, it was basically uh, the ATF had called, and it was several counties away, and they called and asked if we'd come. And um, it was a, it was an Aryan Nation guy, and they, they were going to have to go raid him, but they knew his driveway would be booby-trapped. And so they had actually ha 
uh, land a helicopter in. Jesus. And then once it did that, then we sent a dog up the driveway. And uh, just luckily by working at the West Coast, we had taught the dog to route clear. You yeah. know, just for fun. You yeah. know, we don't route clear, but, you know, we just for fun we did it. And uh, so the dog just went beautifully up the driveway and got all the way to the top and laid down. And sure enough, there was a booby trap across the – What was it? Uh, it was a like little – Smokeless? Or? Yeah. So it was a little smokeless bomb he made, a little pipe bomb he made out. and had it, had it right there. So it worked out beautiful. And then the dog ended up going in there and find a gun stash and uh, and some other pipe, pipe bombs inside. But uh, yeah. What was it? You said he was an Aryan Nation guy? Yeah. Is that big in your area? Or? Well, it's just, no, not really. Like, it's not like we got a huge group of them, but this was a pretty rural uh, part of a county. So, you know, he could hang out there and do all yeah. this stuff and really undetected. Yeah. So, so wow. that's, that's what happened there. Yeah, that's a fucking trip. Um, the, all right, so you you, uh, you transitioned to the bomb dog. It was still a dual purpose, though, yes. right? So mm-hmm. were there, uh, live bite stories from the second dog yeah there's some so the so I, i'm gonna say the best one for my uh next dog was um we had a arm robbery of a, a pharmacy and it was actually in the next city over but he ended up coming through our city and we got in pursuit from probably 40 50 miles and uh um he ended up bailing out and going up into the woods and the problem was that where he bailed out at it was a junkyard so we knew if he got to the top of it, he's going to have several hundred cars to hide in. Yeah. So we finally made it up there, and um, you know we had a couple of agencies with us that didn't have dogs, and and they're trying to go in. I said, "Listen, just 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 hunker down here and let's let's see what happens." And uh, so the guy says, well, "How are you going to know if he finds them?" And I said, well, "You'll know. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll hear it." Yeah. So uh, sure enough, we you know we sent him in there. And, and he didn't want to because we knew the guy was armed. He he was armed when he when he fled the car. You know, but when 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 it comes down to it, it's a tool we have to use to save you know save a, a human. Yeah. So we sent him in there, and it didn't take probably thirty forty five seconds. He he had found him and, and engaged him, and the guy had hit up inside of a trunk of a car. But what he didn't realize it was a, a rust hole mm. in it. So <clears throat> the dog was oh, able to go up in there and engage him. And so that's a bad spot is a bad spot. And, uh, but the kid was ready for it. Like he, he actually prepared for it. He, it was the middle of summer. He was wearing two leather jackets Jesus, to try to counter the bite if he got bit by a dog. And, uh, but it was still a good bite. He still ended up breaking his arm and stuff. Wow. It was is good. That, to, I mean, obviously the dog was a capable dog, uh, compared to your first one, how would you rate the second one? So the second one was a bigger, He's a bigger Dutchie. The first one was a little Malinois. Second one was probably an eighty-pound Dutchie. Um, I would say the second one was even a little bit more high-strung than the first one. Wow. It's just that by then we'd understand how to tame the beast a little bit more. Yeah. But he's a lot of dog. Uh, at times, too much dog. You know, because yeah. what I've learned over the years is that craziness that we first liked. Yeah. Is a pain in the end. And, it's, uh, there's a, a correlation with women and dogs, I think, that exactly. way. You know? I mean, it's just... <laughs> and so crazy, now, crazy is real fun at first, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then it's a pain in the yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, he's a big, strong dog, and so he went in there and engaged him, and we moved in, and luckily, um, <clears throat> one of the guys that was with me was a canine handler also at the same time. And so we went in and pretty much just knew each other what we're going to do. And it's funny because... Um, the dog had, had a little trouble outing live bites, so he you know he'd get into it pretty good, and he's just not going to come off. So yeah. um, when I went in there to to get him, we made sure he didn't have the gun. He threw the gun over to the side for us, and uh, <laughs> we went in and I got him. And I knew instantly when I grabbed a hold of his collar, he's not coming off. Yeah. You know? So I reached up and closed off a little throat action for him to just to start. And and even though it was like a high tense situation, the other canine handlers completely alert of what I'm doing. You know. And so we just had body cameras. We just started body cameras then. So, uh, so right when the dog gets ready to take its first breath to try to catch some air, I tell the dog to let go, and he, sure enough, he comes off. And the canine handler, without missing a beat, the other one says, "Look at that! The first try it comes right <laughs> off for you." <laughs> just so we could have that little documentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking great. Yeah. I thought, man, oh, that's, that's good awesome. times right there. Yeah. So, so, uh, so that dog broke his fucking arm. Huh? Yeah. So we, 
so right after that, about a week later, um, we had a <clears> class <throat> with a federal DA agent. And so the DA is going to teach on liability and use of force and everything. <laughs> so he comes into the class, and, and me and a couple other guys from the department are in there. And so he he already knew I was in there. I didn't know at the time. But uh, so he walks in. He starts talking about this dog and and how he had a client or that they had a defendant come into the federal court. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, it's that's me. You know, yeah. he's talking about me. So he says, you know, this big black duck shepherd on his camera is mauling this guy. And I'm like, oh, no. You know, and yeah. I'm thinking he's going to make mine out of a case of what not to do. And yeah. So. He says, is there anybody in here that would know that dog? And I was like, oh. So I said, yeah, that's mine. And uh, he goes, you know you broke his arm? And I said, yeah. I said, you know, it ain't my fault. You know? Yeah. So. You know, he wouldn't have got bit if he hadn't yeah. ran. Yeah. And so he looked, and then he smiled big, and he was, that's the coolest thing we saw on court all week. And I thought, whoo, man. Yeah. Fuck. He said, that was great. Yeah. yeah. That's but. fucking amazing. <laughs> I, you know, yeah, I mean, one thing that's always kind of surprised me about, and, you know, department to department varies wildly depending on who the chief is and, and yeah. kind of the culture of, of how liberal or conservative they want to be with the use of their canines sure. and kind of, you know, the autonomy that they give their handlers to use them. But it, it's it's always under the guise or backdrop of liability. It is. Which to me seems uh, counterintuitive when you're when you're contrasting it to tasers and fucking guns, right? You know, it's like I would always rather. To me, the dog bite is the lowest on that totem pole because with tasers, it's it's like when when you basically remove the the person's physical ability to sure. to do anything. Like I mean, you've seen people fucking hitting their heads on curbs and or fucking giving them heart attacks. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they got a pacemaker or something, you know. Yep. I mean, there's just. Like I would always rather send a dog before tasering and, and for fuck sure before shooting them. Yep. So to me, it's like if, if, if I was a chief and I had a dog uh, unit, I'd be like, fucking use them. Like you use them as much as you can. Right. You know, like always default to using them before you use everything else. If you can, if it makes sense, you I know, but I think a lot of it is the visual impact. Like, so when you get a dog bite, it's yeah. bloody. And so that's, that's the visual that I think scares everybody. But, you know, with our chief, we were extremely lucky. He he basically said, listen, is this your unit? Yeah. This is the parameters you got to keep it in. And we're very, you know, they were nice parameters. I yeah. mean, you know, he said, this is where I need you to be. Yeah. And uh, so I said, we can do that. And yeah. he said, you have canine problems. I don't have canine problems. So he said, you know, if it needs to be fixed, fix it. If you need to use it, use it. And yeah. So we were very lucky. In fact, we never had any grief. Yeah. Chief. I mean, it, whatever we did, as long as we did it correctly, I mean, he just. Yeah. But how how long was he the chief for when you were there? Um, he was actually a patrolman when I was a patrolman, so we pretty much been there for thirty years. I mean, once he, he was, became chief, once he became the chief, within less than a year, he had dual purpose dogs. So, no, I mean, uh, once he became the chief, how long was he the chief for? Oh, he still is. Oh no, shit. So he's he's still there. Yeah, he's. Um, is that common? It is common um, when they're a little bit younger when they. Go, but he he will retire soon. He's yeah. he's uh, at his age where he can go ahead and leave, and pretty much he's not making any more money from his yeah. retirement. So he's is there a, and maybe it's different department to department. Excuse my ignorance on it. Um, are there term limits for chiefs? Is that nationwide? Yeah, it's pretty much. Yeah. It's uh, of course it's an elected, not elected by the people, but it's elected by the council. So yeah. you know they they choose whether he stays or goes. I got you. Yeah. Uh, do they review that every? So yeah. often, sure. Yeah. It's it's pretty much yearly, you know. Oh, no shit. So with us, we're civil service, so they can't just come in and fire us. You know, there has to be a cause or reason, you know. But with the chief, I mean, he's not under civil service, so if the, today they decide, hey, you're not the best fit, yeah. then he can go. Yeah. So, as you guys know, I am a uh, a gun advocate. I'm a two A supporter. Uh, I have been my entire life. Served in the military. I carry a gun with me pretty much everywhere. Um, and I recently came across and became a member of uh, USCCA, the United States Concealed Carry Association. Um, and I want to tell you about this uh, group because they're a phenomenal uh, patriotic company that uh, understands the advantages and the, the importance of carrying a concealed gun responsibly. Uh, one of the biggest issues, I think, with um, you know the, the anti-Second Amendment crowds these days is the... Um, 
that one, one of it's not understanding, you know, what, what it takes to, to carry a gun and, and really even how they function and, and what it is to shoot them. Um, but also assuming that people are carrying guns that have absolutely no idea what they're doing. What I love about USCCA uh, is that they have uh, 200 easy to understand videos that uh, give you a lot of training. It's not just firearms training though. It's uh, laws that are constantly changing. It's uh, the legalities of if you find yourself in this situation, this is what's legal, this is what isn't. Um, you know, it's kind of a step-by-step -step process that gives you advice uh, and counsel uh, on how to operate a, a concealed weapon, both within the parameters of the law and also from a morality standpoint, uh, kind of the right way to go about it, which is a, a critical component. Um, speaking of the legality aspect, they also provide liability insurance. If you are a USCCA member uh, and you get into a confrontation where a concealed weapon is used, they provide uh, that, that insurance uh, for that scenario, which to me is, is priceless. Uh, and it's also uh, very necessary should you find yourself in that position. Uh, they have a 24-7 access network uh, to legal providers and attorneys in whatever state that you're located in, uh, in whatever uh, area that that, that uh, altercation takes place in, uh, that they assign you that person for that uh, that jurisdiction, so that it's applicable with all of the statutes and laws of that area. Um, the the initial uh, sign up fee is is as low as twenty nine dollars. Uh, they have different um, levels that you can go one, two, and three to become certified. Um, it, it's just it's a phenomenal company. If that's not enough. Uh, they also, um, being a, a card-carrying member of the USCCA, you also get 30% off uh, brands like Sig Sauer, Galco Leather Holsters. I, I own both. I have a, a number of Galco Leather Holsters that I carry uh, some of my Sig Sauer guns in, and, and uh, so those are both two good brands, uh, as well as a subscription to Concealed Carry Magazine uh, to keep you up to date on all things Concealed Carry. Uh, and then again, I want to reiterate that self-defense liability insurance, which, uh, which is huge. So um, I, I think, you know, with the state of our, our country and where it's at, being a responsible citizen means that should you find yourself in a position to protect others, I think you should uh, put it on yourself to do that, and it's the right thing to do. You don't want to do that haphazardly, though. So, um, you know, I don't think everybody should just go out and gra grab a gun and not know what they're doing. I think Responsible gun owners should carry guns and, and use them should they find themselves in that uh, that position. And we all take it upon ourselves to be uh, the protectors of those who cannot uh, protect themselves. And I think the USCCA is a phenomenal organization uh, that bridges the gap from, uh, you know, your average everyday civilian that wants to get involved to somebody who actually can be a protector and, and make a positive net difference in society. So uh, great group. Um, I'm honored to have their their sponsorship. Uh, and that's uh, the United States Concealed Carry Association. If you go to uscca.com forward slash mic drop, you can get, get this process started, become a card carrying member, along with 650,000 other card carrying members across the United States. Phenomenal organization. I can't uh, say enough good things about them. Uh, I am a card carrying member, uh, and they're just a great organization. So again, that's uscca.com forward slash mic drop. All right, so he uh, so he breaks that guy's arm. Uh, were there any other bites with that dog that were uh, pretty significant? Um, were cool stories. Let's see. What's the? It wasn't the great. There wasn't a ton with him. Uh, he found a lot of people, uh, yeah. but I didn't. He didn't have. He had another couple of dog bites, but they were just kind of just yeah. dog bites. Go in there, get them off, and be done with it. You know, yeah. I mean, just people that were, you know, didn't want to come out of the basement or didn't want to come out somewhere, but. Yeah. Uh, the uh, you said he found a lot of people. Did most of them give up once he yeah, found them? Yeah, ninety percent. So one of the funny stories is, so we had a, we did have a we had a robbery and a stabbing. So the guy ends up stabbing a guy, and um, he ends up fleeing and in, in some kudzu. That's just a bond that grows crazy you know, in the south. So uh, he ends up fleeing in it, and all the police get there and they're surrounded it, and they're they're been out there forty five minutes or so trying to get this guy to come out, and he won't come out. I'm not working, but. I'm I'm just happened to be driving my truck, my my regular truck, and I got my police dog with me, just hanging out with me. And they call me and they say, "Hey, can you come over here?" And so I, I come over. I'm in shorts and t-shirt. <laughs> I luckily I got my gun, you know. And uh, so I pull up, and 
one of the, there's another guy on a balcony and he sees me get out and the dog just kind of had a, a presence about him. So even, even with your regular society of the people we deal with, they, they understood that dog when he got out, he meant yeah. business. So as soon as I step out, there's a guy on the balcony. He says, Oh dude, you better come out. He says, Diego is here. So <laughs> this guy jumps out like a rabbit, you know, and he's, here he is. I have a dog that's foaming at the mouth, you know, trying to get him. And he's got five officers over here pointing a gun at him. And I said, just walk towards me. You know, he said, no way. Yeah. He said, I'll take my chance with the five guns other than that dog. And it's so it's really just with them dogs. It's, it's almost like a presence. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah, no, I mean, I've, it stops so much behavior just by their, yeah. them being there. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've seen it uh, a ton of times, even, you know, I've, I've been, you know, traveling with dogs or, or in scenarios where I've seen very, very similar stuff where guys will take their chances with three or four fucking dudes, you know, but a fucking 65 pound yeah. fucking dog jumps out and they're diving through the fucking window to get away from it. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. I cleared out. A, I cleared, <clears throat> we cleared out a bar one time. They have us having, uh, it was all up brawl inside and there was eight of us. It was on a Friday. And so it was eight and there's four more coming. We go inside there and they're not going to listen to us at all. You know, they're brawling fighting. So, yeah. You know, I, at the time I had my first dog and my sergeant just says, just go out and get him. So I come out and I just reel them in the long line and they're coming out the windows. <laughs> they're coming out. You know? So one 60 pound dog cleared yeah. out 300 people. Wow. Where, Did he get anybody or? No, yeah. he, they just cleared out. They were gone. Wow. And, and so I thought, man, this is great. <clears throat> yeah, it's fucking wild. <laughs> uh, how long did you have that second dog for? So I had the second dog eight years. Eight years. Yep. And so, um, and so you, did you just retire him because yeah. of age? And then, yeah. so, uh, what was his, his name's Diego. Diego. Yeah. Yep. So then your third dog, what was that? So my, so I had in between, uh, and I take his back. I had another dog, um, in between the first one and Diego, but I only had him for about two years, year and a half. I had no bites with him. He was a EOD dog. He was a dual purpose dog, but, uh, um, so he was just, a. And then I transferred him over. So when I got Diego, we we got the when I brought him home. The next guy that was in line to be a canine handler, um, I said, "Listen, this is your dog, you know." And so, when he come to the house and the dog is trying to break down the fence to get him, he called me. He said, "That ain't my dog." Yeah. <laughs> so I ended up having to swap my dog with that one to, and and take over Diego. Oh, so because okay. he just he said it's my first dog. I, yeah, I, that's not too what much. I need. That's too much for me. Yeah. So the shepherd was kind of a laid back dog. He was a nice patrol dog, but you know just laid back. Yeah. And, he did have some pretty good, like, so one of the craziest things with that dog, and and it would have never happened if I had the Malinois because he would end up biting everybody at the scenario. But so I end up going to, a, so we get an alarm call. I'm actually going on another call. And we get an alarm call at a at a store, which is an Indian-run store. So they're pretty particular about who works there. It's pretty much family and family only. So I pull, I drive by and look through the window and there's a white guy standing behind the counter, and I'm thinking, okay, something's terribly wrong here. So I go down the street, I park, I come walking in, and and uh, I look in on the corner, and he's coming to the door. So I approach the door a little bit, and he sees me and tells me, say, go around the back, they're robbing us, go around the back, they're going out the back door. And so I just held my ground because I was thinking something right. He goes out the back, and so I'm just thinking he's coming back. So he comes back, unlocks the door, and says they're robbing us they're robbing us and uh and i look down he's got a handgun and so i tell him to get on the ground sure enough the fight's on and he gets away and he gets down so as i'm running i'm thinking this is gonna be the greatest dog bite of all time you know what i mean <laughs> this is gonna be beautiful because my dog's tearing the, the cage down to try to get out because it's all happening right in front so i hit my door kicker and i'm running and i'm thinking at any moment nothing i kick it again nothing and so what happened, unbeknownst to me, was there's an antenna up there, and it broke off. And so I got a few feet out of range from my door kicking. Oh, fuck, so, yeah. Man. So here I am chasing this guy, now thinking, oh, man. <clears throat> and so I end up chasing him. We, he, and he runs around a house, and I chase him. He runs around the house again, and I'm thinking, okay, he's about to set me up. So I stop and turn around and go the other way, and sure enough, he's he got out in the corner waiting for me. He had his gun out waiting for me to come God, around. Damn. And so in the meantime, I had told the next guy that pulled in, I said, jump in my ride bring the dog down here. And so, um, so the guy, the guy standing there and two, two of the guys that work for me are coming down off the ridge and they don't, he doesn't see them. So they just come in and bum rush 
they bum rush them down. And then the same time, uh, the the door kicker when the truck pulled in activated. Oh shit! <laughs> oh, this is yeah, going. this is this is going bad. Yeah. So, uh, so now they're down there fighting with the guy with the gun. The dog is coming across this field wide open to to him. He can see it. I'm out of breath. You know, I'm just running <laughs> half a mile, and so. Right as he gets to him, I just scream out. I tell him to, you know, to off, to lay down. And he comes, runs right in, jumps over the crowd, lays down. And I just thought, if that was my first mellow yeah, he'd be eating somebody's <laughs> he ate asshole everybody right now. in there. You know what I mean? But, so I, I, that was my, that was my best <clears throat> deployment with the dog without getting a dog bite. Yeah. So. Wow. That's some, that's some incredible control. And, and, and the crazy part of it was once we got the guy rest, you know, once we got him down and, um, in his back pocket, he had a V eight. That was a VHS time then. He had a VHS tape, and it it was the tape of the robbery. And so he looks up at me. He says, "Listen, I didn't mean to kill him." He says, "But you need to go check on him." So I said, "Do what?" He said, "Yeah, I shot the clerk. I I killed the clerk." Holy shit! And so I'm like, "What?" So the gun that he had was actually the clerk's. No shit. He had thrown his gun into the weeds when we we're running and pulled out the clerk's gun. But what he didn't realize is the clerk's gun didn't have a didn't wasn't chambered so luckily for us he couldn't yeah. get, he didn't realize it when he clicked it it didn't have a round in it but uh holy fuck so we go back and sure enough the clerk's been shot and the neck the hand the head and uh is he dead no he lived wow. and he still he still owns the store and he's still but Man, uh that's fucking dead and what's great what's crazy about it is here we are <laughs> got him on a stretcher you know trying to get him to the hospital to live and he's worried about locking the store up I said, hey, can you lock the door i'm thinking <laughs> of all <laughs> fucking things <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's uh, personally invested into your business, exactly right? Because like, right. that's I mean, everything he has. He's like, everything he had. Yeah. yeah. Fuck, man. So smooth sack summer is now coming to an end just in time for fresh ball fall. Uh, and I want to talk about our sponsor, Manscaped. Uh, they've got their performance package 4.0, uh, which comes with uh, the, the trimmer, uh, the weed whacker, ear and nose, and nose and hair trimmer, the crop preserver ball deodorant, um, the reviver toner, and they've even thrown in some, uh, some boxer briefs and a travel bag for your convenience. Uh, the, the thing that I love about the Manscaped product, which I've been using for a few years now, um, is that it does a fantastic job at not uh, nicking or being hard on those sensitive areas. And we all know uh, that can be a problem. Uh, it's also waterproof, which to me is a huge deal because uh, it's way less mess and you can go do that shit in the shower. Uh, I mean, we're not animals, right? So do it where it's easy to keep clean. Uh, it's a phenomenal product that, uh, you know, it, it keeps you looking good and feeling good. Um, now that it's fall, you can keep your uh, sack as smooth as a beach ball, but uh, fresher than your old old lady's pumpkin spice. So uh, go to manscaped.com and it's forward slash mic drop. The code is mic drop for 20% off. Plus, again, they're throwing in those boxer briefs uh, as well as that travel bag for you for their uh, fall promotion. So Manscaped, great product. Uh, they've been good to us over the uh, course of the year, and we appreciate their support. Go check them out. And, uh, again, that's manscaped.com, and the code is mic drop for 20% off. Well, so, um, fr like, from a, I guess, rules of engagement, what do you call What do you, what would the police call them rules of engagement-wise? Well, or what would you for as for as as far as use of force, yeah. we basically say use of force. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I knew that. I don't, I don't know if I had a brain fart or what. But <laughs> so the when when the two guys coming down on the ri off the ridge and he doesn't see them, they see him, but they see him with a gun. So he didn't. the The one that bum rushed and hit him did not see the gun. Okay. So, and what happened was I come around and saw and saw him. So I, I immediately ducked back in and went back around. And so I knew because I saw the SUV coming, mine SUV is coming down the street. So I went around and what happened was I didn't see the other two coming. And so they didn't see the gun because he'd hunkered down. Yeah. And so they just bum rushed. Had, you, had they known he had the gun, they wouldn't have yeah. bum rushed. You know, they would have. They just shot him. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um, are you guys communicating on radios? And yeah. This? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, man, that's fucking wild. Uh, I can't believe he shot the fucking clerk. Yeah, he just, and then was that and for, and for, and for no reason. Like, uh, so when you watch the videotape, he basically walks. And he's a transit. He just got off the train. Um, we don't have like a passenger train. It's a, just a cargo train. He just got off of it. Uh, got off the tracks. Walked straight to that store. Walked in it. Uh, waited for the lady to leave. Locked the door. And the clerk had turned his back. 
And so he reached over and locked the door, walked back up to him and said, I need three lottery tickets. He turned around. When he turned back around, he shot him. And uh, and fuck. the guy, the reason he went through hand, because the guy, you know, by reaction, put his hand up. But uh, just shot him. And then if you watch it, he just walks around, takes his lottery card, scratches him off, and just sits there and just scratches him off. And here this guy is still laying there dying. And he just, and then I pull up and you see him look at the camera and then he comes up with this plan of, you know, what. So, and, and, and you know, it's not like great police work. It's just that I, you go back and think, okay, what if that was a one-year veteran? Yeah. You know what I mean? What yeah. he, what he ran through the back and got killed? You know, who knows? Yeah. So for me, I think he, once I see in the outlay of the gun and plus, you know, the, he's a white guy working in an Indian store that yeah. is not going to have a white guy working in a Indian store just because that's their family dynamics. You know, yeah. just. That's just how it works with the store. So, yeah. and and luckily I knew that over the years that yeah. that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, man, that's a fucking trip. Um, wow. What do you know? What uh, did he get charged with attempted murder? Yeah, so he got yep he got charged and uh, he got twenty seven years to life, which he's gonna you know be in there a while. But yeah. uh, you know, I asked him. I said, "So what was your plans?" He said, "My plans were to walk back down, get on the train, move to the next city." He said, "I just." Wow. And I mean, I said, so why shoot the clerk? And he's like, I don't know. I just Man. <laughs> Do you know his story? Like how old he was, where he's he was from probably in his mid, I think he's probably 23 or 24. He was from upstate Kentucky. I mean, not just, fucking, just a wander. Yeah. yeah. He just wandered and he you know, and wanted some money. And so yeah. instead of going there and robbing it, he just went in there and thought, well, I could just kill him and take the, take the tape. And just luckily, you know, like if an alarm car, calls goes off by the time it goes to the alarm company by the time it comes to us by the time we go there's yeah. a lot of time yeah and just luckily when when it come out i was driving by on another call and i saw I'll just get this alarm while i'm here and yeah just, wow. just happened to see it how, how does that come across to you guys is there like a, a code yeah so pretty much everything based on code um <clears throat> you know we we talk plain english a lot now but especially back way back is all coded you know yeah. even your like your alarm calls were coded like Alarm number eight, which we knew then we'd go to a book and that's that store. That store. Yeah. And we did that because so people wouldn't know where we're going or coming. Scanner but, wise or whatever. Yeah, now now it's pretty much you just tell you they give you a code for alarm and then they give you the location. Yeah. Wow. Um all right. So span of year wise, now you're do you count that second dog as as your second dog yeah. of the four? Yeah. So, so he's he's my second dog and then my So Diego so was the Diego third. is actually my third. Okay. Yep. Uh, when you retired Diego, what, what year was that? So that'd be in 2010, Ten. maybe, okay. maybe 10. Yeah. Okay. So your fourth dog. So my fourth dog was, a. Uh, so uh, let me take that back. When I retired Diego, when I got Diego it was 2010. Hmm. So then I retired Diego, uh, eight years later. So that so right 2018 i get the new dog okay and he, he's a he's still a baby seven months old when i get him oh wow and so we just raised him up yeah there. uh so during your time of having diego that's when you went out on the west coast yes so i uh, i'm curious then as a as an active law enforcement officer how did you kind of juggle going out there for different periods of time over a two-year so um my chief luckily my chief was very proactive he whatever benefited you know, me or whatever benefit his department. So his goal was, Hey, if you can go out there and get some better training, come back here yeah. and show somebody. So I asked him, I, I said, I have enough time saved up. We were allowed to roll over a vacation count time as at will. So, um, over the years I'd, I'd accumulated several hundred hours of time off. So I went to him and said, Hey, can I, the first time was a month. I said, I just want, I need a month. I want to go out there for a month. He said, sure. And so I went out a month and then I come back and, Two months later, so they say, "Hey, can you go out again?" So I went out for like two months, and then um, the, the following year, they said, "Hey, can you go out for four months?" So that was a little bit, you know, hard to juggle. Yeah, um, you know, because you got a dog at home, you got a family at home, and that you know, I'm trying to, who's going to watch the dog? Who's going to train the dog? Who's going to work the dog? And so that was kind of a struggle, but it worked out. We got it arranged. Where you know, I had a good group of guys that worked for yeah. me. So. Yeah. Where where were you staying when you went out there? We stayed uh, in Coronado Island. Yeah. Yeah, we stayed in a little. Shit old fucking place or what? Yeah, we yeah. just three of us in there and just <laughs> rented it. And I mean, it was like this big. You yeah. Know, lay on the floor and don't try not to touch each other. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about your time out there. Well, you know, it was a, for me, it was just a humbling experience. I mean, you know, I was honored to, I, I didn't go to the military. I went straight into law enforcement. So there was always something in the back of my mind that think, you know, I, 
I should have went. You yeah. know, I should have. To, not to interrupt, but to me, like the, the military and police, I think are pretty paralleled and synonymous that way though. It's yeah. like, you know, I know a, a shitload of, of law enforcement guys and I've, I've worked with a number of them uh, over the last, you know, 15, 17 years. And, and, uh, to me it, it's like cut from the same cloth. It's just mm-hmm. the same, same type of guys, you know I mean? I, I, to me, it, it's like you could interchange it really, you know, uh, I, th- I think we understand each other really well and, and get along really well for the most part. Um, you know, and I, I just think there's such a similarity with the the type of person that, that does that it's, for a living that it's, you know, it's kind of all the same really. But. I mean, probably 75% of the, or half the departments have been in the military. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and uh, so it is, it's a correlation, but for me, I, it was always part of me that was like, a, you know, I should have done that. Yeah. Like I should have at least done a couple of years of that, but I went straight to law enforcement. So this was an opportunity for me to, to at least give a little bit back. Yeah. And so you know, went, went out and I would say the first little bit was, was challenging because, you know, you know, the personality Yeah. and I'm showing up and they're like, and who are you? And yeah. why are you here? And yeah. you know, what have you done in my world? You yeah. know? So it, it was a little bit of a challenge uh, at first, but I think, I think once maybe they realized that I wasn't there to be, you know, just there to help, yeah. you know? And, and, and so once they figured out that, you know, I wasn't an idiot, you know, I, I at least knew what I was talking about at the time and, and so I kind of the time, yeah, you know what I mean, so <laughs> I don't anymore, don't but at about, the time, know, I knew. At the time, you know, so, uh, and, and after that it was, as good. It, it, you know, it was a, it was neat. You know, you think there's not very <laughs> few people that have got to do that yeah. opportunity. And it was, a, it was just a humble experience for me to go out and then to be asked to come back out and then be asked to come yeah. back out. And so, um, it was, it was a really good time for me. I, you know, I learned stuff. I learned just as much as I was teaching yeah. you know, because I'm thinking, Holy cow, that's a, that's a totally different way of thinking that, you yeah. know, and, and just little things like little things from one perspective to the other. Like, so, you know, they were teaching me things and, and then, you know, like the, just like a, like a baby thing that was like so simple in one mind, but not in the other, you know, it was like, Hey, when you come up to the door, what's our first thing to do with the bomb dog or with a troll dog is to down them. You know what I mean? down that dog at control. And I said, I said, yes, we, we want to do that. And I said, what, but what I learned just from making mistakes, I said, if I down my bomb dog right off the bat, what if there's a bomb behind there? How are you going to tell, you know what I mean? How's he going to give you that change that there is something? I said, so, you know, like, what about if I just do a simple task of letting him have one to two seconds to, yeah, and then down him, you know what I mean? And see if you see that change. And, and so it was little stuff like that. And then the next day they'd be like, nah, Oh, what about this? And I'm like, holy smokes, that, yeah. that's genius. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, so that's good shit. Do uh, and if if uh, talking beforehand, uh, you were out there not long after I was there. This was probably the same same, same badge group. of dogs. Yeah. Uh, any of them stick out as? Uh, of course, there's Duke. At, you know, yeah, Duke Dukas. At, yeah. Oh my gosh. So so my first experience with him was uh, nobody tells you. They, they think it's funny, but uh, you know, Dukas is like nine foot two. You know, yeah. And so I'll, I'll tell you my introduction to him when you're done. <laughs> So uh, I, I go over to the gate and he's kind of staring at me. You know, he's half wagging the tail, half looking at me like. So I get him out and here I'm walking. We walk probably ten feet and he's happy and I'm thinking, yeah, it's great. He just does that little spin, comes right to you, and wraps me. Yeah. And it's out, out of the blue. I think it was Josh Bunning. He says, "You better be careful with that." <laughs> <laughs> so I just kind of like try to string him out. You know, I'm thinking, yeah. oh, and and you the can't. Fight, you can't. Yeah. You know, and I'm thinking, oh my god. And, He's trying to kill me now, and I'm thinking, what if I, you know, yeah. I've been here ten minutes. And yeah. Die. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- yeah, I mean, so similarly, um, so w- when he first came in, uh, we p- we put him right into a handler course, and so uh, and it was at it was at Auburn at their uh, CDRI oh. back back when it I don't even think they still have it, or if they do, it's not at the same place. But um, <clears throat> so we were hosting our our handler course there and putting a handful of dogs through Duke as being one of them. And so they were staying in like a holiday Inn express, um, at the time. And, and the handler, uh, I won't say his name, but, um, he, he's a big guy, you know, he's big, big athletic, strong, fucking strapping young buck. And which was a good fit for, for that dog. Cause he, you know, he needed that. But, um, but anyway, so he's got him loose in, in the fucking hotel room, you know, and they're, and they're just kind of hanging out. And, and, uh, so, uh, Wayne Dodge, who I'm, I'm hopefully going to have on, on the show at some point, who 
uh, you know, if I had to, to pick a, a single mentor of, of, uh, within the working dog world, it would be Wayne. But, um, at any rate, you know, so he's, he's in there, the, the handlers in there and, and, uh, the holiday Inn express, it was one of those like Friday nights or whatever nights where they, they have food, food. and they had pizza. And so I've got a fucking paper plate with like, I don't know, two or three pieces of pepperoni pizza on it. And I walk in not expecting the dog to be fucking loose. And, uh, and you know, as soon as I walk in, he cues up on me, his tail's feather and he fucking runs over and he jumps up and bats it out of my fucking hand and then starts eating it. And I was like, motherfucker. And I, and I reach down to, you know, to, to take it back and he just stops and he like looks up at me and, and you know, from having been around, he's one of the very few dogs that between his sizes and just his presence and energy, like he looked at me like, motherfucker, I hope you try to grab that pizza. And I was just like, you know what? I'm not fucking with that dog. I'm, yeah. I was like, you, you can have that yeah. shit. It's yeah, not it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, it's I, like, got yeah. I, mean, yeah. I got that for you. I got that for you. I'll let your handler deal, or, deal with swamp ass later if, if this fucks you up, but I'm not getting bit over it, especially not by that fucking dog. Yeah, he's just a big monster yeah. dog. Yep. And it was one of those dogs too where, um, you know, like you, you couldn't put enough on to to keep him from fucking you up in a suit i mean even in a in a semi-comp weight so you know a thicker suit with fucking nine millimeter gauntlet wetsuit gauntlets and i mean fucking whatever you could put underneath it nothing was enough to keep him from fucking hammering you uh, I, and he loved it yeah yeah he was a he was a remarkable dog no no two ways about it um what overall i guess from, from an experience standpoint uh how would you kind of characterize your time there well, just pure enjoyment. I'll be on. I just, uh, it, it was, even though I missed home and, you know, got a wife and kids at home, it was just one of the moments that you had to, to let sink in to say, Hey, there's probably what 20 people in the world that got to do this so far and take it all in. And I'm, yeah. I, I just enjoyed it. And you know, and it was just, uh, after that first initial week or whatever, it was shocking how, how quickly they accepted yeah. me to be there. You know, it was, yeah. Then it was like instant, you know, instead of that little bit of standoff, like, Hey, prove yourself. Now it's like, Hey, we're getting ready to go do this. You're coming. You know, yeah. going to do that. We're kind of, you're coming. Yeah. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So it was good. It was, it was, it was, it was a wonderful time. Yeah. Any, uh, any other funny stories from your time there of, uh, dogs doing squirrely shit? So, uh, Nico. Yeah. So I got there and, and the handler said, Hey, you know, you want to help me make, let's maybe work on out today. So sure. So, you know, he said he's having trouble out and, you know, he's, and so I, I saw him take a bite, and I said, well, sure. You know, he dog's a pretty strong dog. So I said, hey, I got a genius idea. I said, it's worked before for me. I'm going to get in a bite suit. I'm going to wait him out a few minutes. As soon as I start hearing him re release or feel it release, you tell him out, get him off. Okay. So he engages me. Luckily, I'm sitting on a couch, and he's on the couch. The dog's on the couch. So I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm thinking, hey, five minutes, we're going to be good. So an hour goes by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know the dog. You yeah. know what I mean? An hour goes by. And not only is he not letting go, it's got more intense. Yeah. And so, so at some point between the hour and the hour and a half range, he actually begins to fall asleep. <laughs> so his eyes are wandering, but as soon as it opens back up, he, he just yeah. tightens back up. And so that, <laughs> so we worked on that and worked on it, you know, spent half the day with him attached to me. Finally, I just said, okay, uh, just choke him off there and let's, <laughs> let's restart something else. So. <laughs> That didn't yeah. work for me, but yeah, old Nico is uh, yeah, he's a special dog too. I mean, shit, he's still kicking. You know, yeah, the, uh, yeah, he, he was he, he was just a cool dog, and yeah, you know, some you know, he was just one of them dogs. that's like some days he's like you go by him and he's a tail's wagging. The next time you walk by and he's like, yeah. like okay, today's yeah. not the day. Okay, I'll just go <laughs> do something else. You know, so. yeah, yeah, no shit. Uh, all right, so you come back from there, um, and and you still had Diego at this point. Um, so you finish your time with Diego, and then you get your fourth dog. Yep. So my fourth dog was a, he's a big Dutch shepherd. He's about 87 pounds. Uh, kind of like Duco. He's, he's big and athletic like him, big head. And, uh, he's not super handler hard. He does engage me a few times, but it's just out of frustration, you know, just driving frustration. But, uh, but he's hard to deal with. Um, he's just a dog that when it's time to work, it's just time to work and there's nothing that's going to stop him from it. And so he, he was one of my, favorite dogs just because you could teach him anything he could learn but uh he definitely has been a challenge to yeah. deal with and so you know me i'm honored 75 pound guy he's a eight, he's a 90 pound dog that is full of muscle if he yeah. wants to go somewhere 
You yeah. know, if he's if he's locked in on a bad guy, you know, I'm trying to get my announcements over real quick because I know once he catches yeah. them, it's over. You know, yeah. and so uh, <clears throat> at at this point, did you guys have a more kind of regimented or structured uh, process? Yeah. So now we got um, we got six dogs by then, and you know we got pretty good structure and everything's in order. Pretty much after 2007 or eight, when we got we went full into, Hey, we're going to be in charge of our own train. We're going to, you know, do it. And then once we got that structure and started sending guys out to every class we could go to, to learn different things. And then it just come back and then it all just kind of fell together. So, yeah. so now we got a pretty streamlined process of who, who gets elected, who, you know, what, yeah. what you got to do to get on. And, and were you uh, getting dogs all from the same place or were you ele- able to get them from wherever? Yeah, we could get them wherever. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> as long as they were under a certain amount of money, which at the time was, feasible for pretty much everywhere yeah. um, we could go we did buy several from uh, cobra canine mm-hmm. and uh and then at the time we got the last one um, it was just kind of pot luck you know everybody was having trouble getting yeah. dogs at that time and and so we end up going to another vendor and just happened to yeah be at the right place at the right time when it came in and got them so yeah and uh so that's where this fourth dog, fourth dog came from that's what yeah so Ooh. no fourth dog come from um uh, uh, Las Cabrera down in Florida. Mm. So we, we, he got them for us. And so, and what was the, uh, what was the name of that dog? His name is Zlatan, Z L A T A N. Oh, okay. So can't, I can't imagine where he came from. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So tell me, tell me, uh, kind of his, his, uh, career. So he's, um, he's just a strong wheel dog. So he, so he's seven months old when we got him. Um, uh, by the time he was about, 14 months old he was actually on the road which was really not something we did yeah uh but um he was such a strong little dog well i say little dog big dog that uh you know we put him on the road and just realized if there's certain situations we're not going to put him in you know because he's still baby you know yeah. even though he's showing to us but but from that point on he really never did back down he just went full force and full so i actually went a little <clears throat> while um before I got my first bite with him, I found a lot of people. We, we did a lot of, you know, building searches with him, finding people. We did a lot of tracking, finding people. But uh, And he was a bomb dog also. He was a bomb yeah. dog also, yeah. But out of all the dogs, he was the one I was a little bit more worried about when he did engage, that he would create a lot of damage. So I was a little extra careful with him. I didn't want, you know, it had to be something pretty severe before I wanted to bite because that first bite, I was thinking, ah, you know, if he really mangles somebody, is it worth it? So. Yeah. But before you get into that, can you kind of walk us through from a use of force standpoint what your mental checklist is as to the no go no go criteria? Right. So, so basically, it used to be like a felony or not a felony, but that that's just that went out the window pretty fast because you know you realize, you know, you might have a theft of ten thousand. Well, that's a felony, but if a guy assaults a police officer, it's a misdemeanor. You know, really? I mean? yeah. So, how the fuck is that? Yeah, possible? isn't that crazy? So, I didn't realize. Yeah. That. So. Why is that even, I mean, has it always been that way? Yeah, it's always been like that for us. I mean, it's, wow. so we had to go away from that pretty fast because we're thinking, hey, if a guy assaults us and we're, we're going to use this dog, you know, yeah. and so we just got away from that. Now we just go severity of the crime. So we, we have zero problem using our dog for any crime. It's just, you have to understand that, hey, if it's a, if it's a hit and run or a bailout and it's a, it's a not a, you know, dangerous crime. We can use them to find them, but you better understand your dog. You better be able to read it. Yeah. And so that when it does get close to that guy, you can stop, get undercover and not use them unless you had, you know, unless the, this scenario changed, you yeah. know? So uh, that's pretty much our process. It's just the severity of the crime and, and it can't even be black and white because each thing is different, you know? So you go off of, Hey, if, if this guy didn't assault anybody, however, every time we get a hold of this guy, he assaults the police. Well, then we're going to use the dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but if it's, you know, Joe Blow, that he's just a, a local guy that steals stuff, well, at the end, we're not going to. You yeah. know what I mean? Unless the scenario changes, you know. Yeah. So, uh, and and the, the scary part about that is it all happens within seconds. Sure. You know, you're trying to rotate it out in your brain and, yeah. you know, is this good, this bad? And because, you know, you, you know, working a dog, I mean, you might get them out and they say, Hey, you ran that way. And that guy circled back. So in 10 seconds, you might be engaged, you know, yeah. you might be laying right there and you engage them. So sure. it, it's, uh, it's not something you can 
drag out as you go. It's a process yeah. you got to come up with then. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so the the first interaction where that actually came to to where he was biting somebody, how did that go down? Okay, so this is this is this is actually probably my best engage. I mean, it's it's probably most most memorable engagement yeah. put that way. Uh, so I'm getting ready to go home, and uh, one of the guys comes in and says, "Hey, the marshals are here. They got a guy in town that's hiding out, and uh, they've been tracking him all over the country." And they, and they got him pinned down to a trailer park. So I said, okay. What was, do you re- recall, or, or at that time, did you know what, why they were following or what so his deal was? They, they, he was uh, an Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, he was a big, he was a big boy in the unit. And uh, he he violated his parole for some uh, firearm charges. And so he was on the run. So they tracked him down. And so I thought, well, all right, let's run out here and grab him real quick. And so, you know, because they said, oh, he's bad and he's a tough guy. Well, you know, I mean, everybody, after 30 years, you kind of become numb. You know, thinking, okay, everybody's a tough guy yeah. and, you know, okay, whatever, you know. So yeah. so we get out there and we go to the first trailer. He's not in there. And then they go to the next trailer. They think he's in. He's not in there. So we're two hours into this search for this guy. And I'm thinking, by this time, I've kind of got whatever. You know, he's not in here. And yeah. so... Finally, uh, they all knock on the door, and a lady says, okay, he's in that trailer right there. And so I turn around and look, and the trailer's probably got 40 cameras on it. So I'm thinking, oh, great. Yeah. He's been watching us for <clears throat> two hours preparing for this. So, you know, the marshals have a little bit different rules of engagement. They they don't knock. They just take the door off the hinge, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so off comes this door, and uh, they start making announcements to come out, and nothing Make some more announcements. Nothing. So finally, um, a guy comes out. He's a heroin addict. He comes crawling out, and he says, hey, he's in here. He's in the back. He's not coming out. He said he says he's going to take it to the end. He said he's not going back to prison. So get in there. And uh, so by now, you know, of course, all these announcements, my dog's lost its mind. It's it's out of control. It's, it's For two hours, it's listened to this. So. It's lost its mind. It's tearing the walls down. I'm trying to hold it back. It's ripping the sheetrock off the walls and uh, trying to get down the hall. And I look down the hall where this guy's supposed to be, and there's a Malawa sitting on the bed. No shit. And I'm like, oh, my <clears throat> God, this can't get any worse. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm like, so we go 13 minutes of announcements just because of who he was. And, you know, we, we were trying to come up with a plan to how to get in there without anybody getting hurt. And, yeah. uh, you know, and – by the intel, we really didn't know complete about him, but he had a pretty good long rap sheet. So I thought, well, he's probably going to give a pretty good fight. And so, are uh, are is smoke or tear gas? Uh, or is that not being used? Or it, it is, but really, it's only uh, it's not used very often. Oh, you know, okay. I mean, it, I mean, it's pretty much a a standoff type thing. Here, we were kind of like still in that mentality of, hey, he's got a warrant, let's just get him. He's in yeah. the room. We got enough guys. Got a dog. Let's go grab him. So. So after about 13 minutes of announcements, I make my way down the hall with a dog. It's a trailer, so the, the the room is really small, but it's full of stuff, full of clothes and stuff. Is it like shithole? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so there's this Malawas sitting on the bed staring at us, and I'm thinking, I'm trying to shoot it off the bed. I'm like, let's go. He's just looking. And your dog's right next to you? Yeah, so my dog's right here, Keyed. You know, he's he's ready to go, so I'm thinking, man, I sure hope this doesn't go bad. Is he paying attention to the dog? No, he's not, he hasn't looked at the dog one time yeah. yet. So so I finally just, I said, well, here it goes. So I reel him in there, and up on the bed he goes, pushes the dog off the bed, and he's wow. hunting around, and comes back down. And he's he's in there searching, and nothing. And I'm thinking, well, heck, this guy's not in here. He's got out. So I reel in a little bit. I walk in, and... uh some clothes i just peel back a little bit of the clothes and and boom here it is the fight's on he comes up out of the clothes and uh and and we're fighting so now i'm fighting i mean they were by myself because nobody else wants to come in because there's a dog in there yeah but in the back of my mind i'm thinking why is my 90 pound dutch shepherd not attached to this man you know so we're fighting and fighting so in the meantime a, a canine handler that was with me that uh, an ex-canine handler, he comes through the crowd, comes in. You know. Before you get any further on that, just you say you're fighting. Is this guy the bad motherfucker that everybody yes. said? Like, so, so, so he's this, tossing you around? So and, this is the bad dude. Yeah. Okay, so um, 
you know, is he punching you and or like what? So yeah, so we're in a little bit of a we're so we're in a fist fight, you know. Yeah. But he's down. I'm on top, so I feel I feel pretty good about it, you know. Even though he's a lot larger, I, I've got the upper hand, but I'm still in my mind thinking because ultimately I got a dog loose in this trailer. I'm thinking, oh my god, where's this dog at? And I'm thinking he's down the hall, you know, eating somebody down there. And so yeah. the other canine handler jumps in, and when he does, he's got an MP5 here, and the guy reaches up, boom, snatches it. Damn. So now it's changed dynamics. You know what, what does that do for you guys, use of force wise, if they grab a gun? Yeah. So now, now we're 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 basically when it comes down to it, we're we're in lethal force. Yeah. You know. So but, you could shoot them at yeah, that point. But we're in a kind of a situation that we can't even do that. You know, we're just trying to get this. So we're fighting to get this gun back, and uh, finally we get we manage to get the gun back. And, uh, and I'm still in my mind thinking, why? Where's my dog? So I'm yelling for him. So I look over out of the corner of my eye and I see about that much of his tail sticking out and he's been under there the whole time attached. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> this so, guy's like, it's not even happening. Never made a noise. Holy so, fuck. So he's pretty much now. Is he hopped up on shit? No, wow. so he's not. He's not hopped up on anything. So this, this 90 pound Dutch shepherd now is practically taking off his calf. It's coming out. It's coming off. And uh, so we, I finally get him up and I still don't know this yet that he's attached. You know, I just see his tail and think things. I'm thinking, okay, he's got him somewhere, but I'm thinking from no reaction, he's probably got a boot. He's got something to where this guy's not feeling the pain. And, uh, so we finally get him handcuffed, get him up. And sure enough, he's, he's attached and like molar deep. Yeah. Like he's like pulling it off. It's coming out. And so I get him off. Guy never makes one sound, never makes one expression, nothing. And so we walk him outside, put him on the, on the porch and uh of course my dog's amped up through the roof you know and i take him back to the car come back up and i look at him i said dude why wouldn't you just come out you know and his his first quote to me was he said listen he said no offense he said but i'm 49 years old he said i've spent my entire life incarceration except for five years when i was a kid he said my job he said your job is to come get me my job is to make it really difficult for you. And I said, and he said, I felt I did pretty good. And uh, I said, I looked at him, I said, well, let me ask you something. I said, what would you have done if you got that gun? He said, I'd kill both of you. He said, I'd have killed you both. I wouldn't have thought about one thing about it. He said, I'd have went out of my business, went into prison, didn't care at all. So we had a little conversation there, and he was actually oh. a, a very interesting, he's an interesting guy, you know, to talk to. He wasn't. You know, most most guys you get that are that say they're bad and tough. When you, once you get them handcuffed, they run that mouth and talk about what they're going to do when the handcuffs were off. Well, they were off to begin with. We put them on there. You know? yeah. So, um, <clears throat> but this guy wasn't like that. It was a, uh, it was like a job. That was his job. And so, uh, I got him up and walked him over to the car and I said, "Listen, we got to take you to the hospital. You know, half your calf's gone." And he said, "No, I'm not going to the hospital." He said, "Take me to the jail." He said. I got five years to pull, he said, and it started 10 minutes ago when your dog was attached. And so, of course, the jail wouldn't take him. We had to take him to the hospital. And there we had even more conversation with him. And I'm like, okay. I said, just so I know, at what point was my dog attached to you? He said, the whole time. He said, when he came off that bed and cleared my dog off, he went straight under. He said, when you pulled it back, he said he was already attached. And I said, and you didn't say nothing. He said, it's my job. He says, "What? That's what I do." He said, "You know, I spent forty-five years in prison, and so." How, wait a minute. I mean, he's forty-nine. How how did he go to prison at five years well, old? He he means like uh, incarceration. So his oh, dad, like his dad, boy's family. home or some yeah, shit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you. he's yeah. So he said, "I've been incarceration, you know, my whole life." So, yeah. um, so we get we get down there, and uh, I get talking to him. And he said, "I pulled off his shirt, and he's covered from." I had to toe in Nazi tattoos. You know, I had some of the coolest tattoos I've ever seen in my life. But there's bullet holes. You know, he's got bullet holes. He's been gutted from top to bottom. He's been, you know, this is the real deal, dude. And uh, he says, he says, this is nothing. This is just street credit for me. You know, I go back into pen. He says, I get back into my status, and it's no big deal. Life, life goes on. You know, and uh, he, in fact, he told me, he said, you know, in fact, I'm just going to tell you, your dog's a bitch. He said, <laughs> it wasn't that bad. And I was like, what? You know, what I mean. And I'm like, I just kind of looked, you know, I said, well, okay, you know, yeah. but you know, he was very cordial about it. And he said, listen, he said, I'm going to tell you straight up. He said, there's, there's no, 
there's no hard feelings between me and you. If I get out in five years and I see you on the street, he said, I don't even have no problem buying you dinner. He said, it's a job. It's your job, my job. He said, now, if I got that gun, I would have killed you. He said, I wouldn't have cared one bit. I wouldn't have lost sleep over it. I wouldn't have, you know, worried about it. That's a a, a strange uh, ability to compartmentalize things that exactly. way. You know? and, it, and it was it was one of them moments in my life that I thought, you know, there's a lot of guys that talk how tough they are. This guy didn't wasn't talking tough. He's just matter of fact. This yeah. is what I do, and he he showed you just in that ten minutes what he was willing to do to yeah. get it. And, yeah. Uh, now it was funny. Like four <clears throat> days, four days later, I was in the courtroom, and he come in. He was in a wheelchair. He's come walking in or rolling in. And he said, you know what I said about your dog? I said, yeah. I lied. <laughs> <laughs> He's dog has jacked me up. Um, so, but he, uh, that's but, fucking great. But it, it was a, a, a funny experience to think, you know, like, I, I, you know, we've wrestled a lot of people over the times. And yeah. all, everybody's a tough guy. You know, yeah. it's just the, it's the way the world is. Everybody's tough. And this guy here was just a matter of fact. Yeah, you know, like I, he was legit. Legit one percent. I mean, he's a legit. This is what he does for a living. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I'd kill you. And man, yeah, no so with, with those guys, um, like, is is running drugs and guns and like, are, are they just all illegal shit or what? Like, do yeah. You, so do you know the, so your main, you know, your main group of dudes in that, you know, they're it's an enterprise. Yeah, you know I mean, they so it's pick, an organized crime like anything else. Yeah, they just <clears> pick <throat> something that they're good at and they just, you know, if if methamphetamine is what they're good at that's what they're gonna run if stealing okay. stuff is what they're good at that's what that group's gonna run so yeah. do you know what he did no nope, he yeah. wouldn't he wouldn't say nothing wow uh, so he, with him was he like a twice convicted felon then or yeah he, so even he, more, more than that he, he'd he been he said he'd been in and out several times um he ended up having an armor out, i think with somebody dying in the robbery so he'd been in there for several years and got out and then He'd been in there his whole life and still got out and went back to methamphetamine. You know, he said, yeah, because he could get in prison too. Yeah. So, I mean, it, man, what well, is Tennessee not a three strikes? No. Yeah. And it, it, it was a federal crime. Anyway. You know, it was a federal parole. Thanks anyway. Yeah. So for us, we were just picking yeah. him up. So he, he's going back for five years. Yep. He's like been, even with, even with fighting you guys that yeah, way. So like we, we will, we charged him in ours and then, uh, they were usually, if it's federal on that, they'll, Either just transfer him over, or once he gets out of jail with ours, they'll transfer him over. So he's got at least five years to pull on his parole, though. Yeah. Um, do you, Do you know if he had just said like when you made the announcement, "Yep, yeah, okay, I'm coming out," versus what he did, what that, what the difference is in terms of how much longer he's going in? Um, no, uh, not not exactly. <clears throat> but unfortunately, unfortunately, that. There isn't a whole lot. If you fight the police. Yeah, I mean, that's not considered a misdemeanor, though, right? If he's grabbing a fucking MP5 and. You, you'd, you'd actually be shocked, like, on how little a time that the guys get for, for that. Yeah. Because in most people's minds, like, well, it didn't happen. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just an assault. You know what I mean? So he, he'll he get. He's probably back in federal prison now. You know, he's probably. He probably only stayed in ours probably six months. And he's. How long ago did this happen? Um, This one here was probably. Two and a half, two years ago, maybe. Yeah, somewhere, wow. somewhere in that, somewhere in that time frame. Um, so the, you, you said the dog's name. I'm not even going to try to repronounce it. But uh, <laughs> so he uh, was that his first fucking bite. So that was his first. In, yep. Bite. Wow. Now he had been. You, you guys have a habit of throwing dogs in the fucking lion's den on their first man, go, I, man. I, it, it was. It was crazy, and you know, Jesus. And, and <clears throat> if if all works out, we wouldn't. We don't want to yeah. do that. But no, I it mean, was just in in. All honestly, like when I went up there, to me, I, in my mind, I wasn't even thinking. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm going to pull up to the thing, make my announcement like 99% of people do, and they come out. I yeah. give up. I put them back in the car. I go home. You yeah. Know I mean? So, yeah. you know, I give him his tennis ball or something to play with, and we go to the yeah. house, you know. But yeah. uh, it, it, How old was he at this time? So he was just, so he's he's probably three, three and a half, okay. somewhere three. So so he, he was definitely a mature yeah. dog, and he had had uh, – you know, during training, he had had some accidental, field <laughs> some games. accidental live bite. So, so the live bite part really for me wasn't an issue whether he's gunning or not. Yeah. He would, but uh, that was a situation. You know, you got a guy under a pile of clothes, you got another a Malawas sitting in there. I mean, it, that that other dog never did anything. No, they he pushed out, and the dog said, "See you, gone." Wow. Yeah, he's he moved down to all like, hey, man, I, I gave it my best effort. You're on your own, yeah. dude. He's wow. So. Um, did you have more more engagements with him after that? Yep. So then. So I go to my say my last one. So my last one with him was uh, a passive. 
as a passive bite. So we, we got some intel that somebody was coming down the interstate with a huge load of uh, methamphetamine. So we set up with the, the highway patrol and sure enough, here he comes. And so after quite a little while of pursuit, uh, he ends up going through some fields and bailing out. So by the time we get in there and pull out, he's gone. You know, he's run. So we do a track and it's, it's been some time since he's bailed and doing the track. So we're doing the track. We get about half an hour in and I can tell okay, we're getting close, you know? And so I really know I'm getting close when the dog gets hit five times by the electric fence and still wants to go through it, you know? So I said, okay, he's, he's back here. So we get back through there. It's a little bit downward grade and uh, it's raining and <laughs> like a hot wire cattle fence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, <clears throat> it's raining and he basically dragging me. I, I'm not going to stop him. You know, I, I've trying, but it's not going to happen. You know, so I'm thinking to myself, I sure hope this is going to be a good dog bite. Cause we ain't found the dope yet. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And sure enough, he drags right down there, goes through the weeds, catch the tree catches me. So I'm kind of trying to go through and next thing it stops, the pull stops and he's engaged. So, <laughs> Man. But the, what's crazy about it was, is the guy had a condition that it was probably from the methamphetamine use, but uh, that when he got like a certain amped up, his he would pass out. Really? Yeah. So he he, he was unconscious. He, he's passed out. Holy fuck! Yeah. My, <laughs> Where did he grab him? Right in the back. Oh I mean, just, fuck! Yeah. So it it was a good dog bite. It was the last one right before I retired. So it was a man. It was a good one, you know. And then and the guy never. Once again, never responded because he, he passed out, yeah. you know, and so and that didn't didn't affect the dog whatsoever. He didn't yeah. care. You know, that didn't didn't make him come to either. huh? No, like, he woke up uh, probably three to four minutes later. And wow. Didn't even realize he'd been dog bit at the time yeah. until he woke up a little bit and said, man, yeah. Merton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where where in the back did he grab? So him? right in the right between the, the rib section here. Yeah. Yep. Did he break any ribs? Or? Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. I took we took him to the hospital and it was uh, <clears throat> the. Um, the TBI, which is our, you know, state police, they, they took them. Yeah. So they end up charging and took them. So yeah, we're like super. Well, uh, when you said that you got a call coming in that there was a big shipment of of meth coming in, uh, was that like from a, a source or from highway interdiction? Or no, so that one in itself come from just an informant. So basically, okay. somebody that said, "Hey, I'm pretty sure this guy's coming into town. He's got yeah. he, he's went to Atlanta and he's coming back." So yeah. Uh, Did you guys end up finding it? Yeah. yeah, it was seven pounds of yeah. first amount. So. What does that equate to street value wise? It depends. Like if he buys it straight out, eighty thousand. But if it's broke up, you're probably talking quarter million. No oh, shit. If more than that, probably seven pounds. Yeah. Wow. I mean, because that's what enough to fit in like a fucking yeah, it's McDonald's pretty, bag, yeah, right? It's I a mean, pretty bag of crystal meth. Yeah. Not that big. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, that whole world is fucking. I mean, it's. Part of it is fascinating, which I hate to use the word fascinating, but it really is. I mean, it just, uh, but it's terrifying too. I mean, like the, the amount of shit that comes along with that. I mean, because I, I do have a, a fairly libertarian, I guess, viewpoint on most things, but it's it's hard to kind of reconcile that with with the things that that come along with with drugs and, yep. and shit like that. You know, it's like, I don't give a fuck if people do whatever they want to do. Like, you know, I, I'm happy to leave them alone as long as they leave me alone kind of thing. But, but it's, it's impossible to separate the baggage that comes along exactly. with, with yeah. that, you know? And so that, that to me, that's where it's hard to just be like, Oh no, you do whatever you want. You know, you can't, you can't be a, an active heavy heroin and methamphetamine addict and have a productive, you know, yeah. you're not going to be a productive person aside. I mean, to me, it's probably fair to take it even a step further and say you're going to be dangerous, yeah. you know, or like you're going to be a, you're going to be counterproductive and, and a, scor a scourge to society if, if, if that's what your deal is, yep. you know. Because you got to get it somehow. <clears throat> if you yeah. ain't working, you're going to get it. You know, you're going to do whatever it takes to get it. Yeah, so. yeah. Um. So that was your last bite with him? That was my last yeah. bite, yep. Um, so how, how long was it before, between when that happened and then when you ultimately retired? Um, that was, so it was this year. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so just Pretty a few reason. months, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you've been retired for how long? Since June 1st. June 1st. Yeah. How, uh, how is that going overall? It's great. Have, uh, you, have you lost your mind at all yet? I'll be honest with you, the first, like, I, I was kind of like one of the ones that said, Phew, I'm out of here and never looking back. You yeah. Know, I'm done. Now I'm you're gone. looking back. Yeah. And so like the first 45 <laughs> days I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, I, I'm not sure I made the right decision here. I'm not, mm. 
I'm not sure this was it because you know, I'm still kind of active. Of course, I still attach the canine unit with training that part. And so I'm still like getting emails and text messages and I'm thinking, oh man, I need to be back in that. Yeah. It took me about a month and a half and then I'm kind of like, okay, this is, that's gone. This is my new, this is my new life. And yeah. just, just do it. So, yeah. so now that I've done that, I mean, it was, it was a great part, you know, was, but yeah, moving on. Yeah. So. I was going to ask, um, did, did your police department have a SWAT team mm -hmm. and, uh, did you guys ever incorporate canines? We did. Yep. Yeah. So, um, when our new chief come on, well, actually take that back right before our new chief come on, uh, our older chief was very non confrontational you know what I mean? And so the chief we have now actually convinced them to get a, our first, you know, SWAT team. So we had it. And then, you know, like everything else, you know, just 14 or 15 of us just, yeah, there you go. You're a SWAT team. So yeah. the first, actually the first deployment our SWAT team had, the first one ever, uh, was a gunfight. The, fir really? the first, I mean, it's crazy, but our old chief's like, listen, don't get me in trouble. You know, let's just do it. <laughs> and then the first one, boom, yeah. it, it's a, it's a gunfight. What so, was the circumstance? The cir um, so I had a, a guy sound coke and uh, we did a search warrant on him. And he thought at first the reason the initial gunfight broke out, he thought he was getting robbed. Oh, really? So, cause we didn't have, you know, we didn't have a SWAT team back then. Yeah. So nobody even thought about police yeah. breaking the door down, you know? Yeah. So, uh, when the door come open, he just he opened fire and we opened fire back and then the next thing he realizes, oh my gosh, this is not this yeah. is not the bad guys, you know. Yeah. So wow. So it, it worked out. It worked out. So you didn't end up killing him. No. He 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 actually was uh when he opened fire, he was behind a refrigerator. So oh, okay. Yeah. We killed the refrigerator, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's wild. How how was the integration of canine and, and the SWAT team? Um, so the the first basically we just started you know, we didn't know any different. We just brought him in and then realized, hey, like maybe that dog right there is not the best suit for. Yeah. And we started realizing, hey, not every dog can just be a SWAT dog. So yeah. we just start slowly integrating. And even even my first dog, the high strung dog, he was a great deployment dog, but not, you know, not the greatest uh, team dog. You know, yeah. he he was pretty high strung, and if you yeah. pushed his buttons too hard, he's gonna bite you too. And yeah. so we had to realize that not just any dog can be integrated. And yeah. so we had to just kind of back up. And at the time, that's all we had was that dog and another dog. So, uh, we made it work, but we knew our limitations. Yeah. And then as we went on, we'd get dogs and realize, okay, that dog can slide yeah. in here. And yeah, it does take a pretty special dog or, or a pretty specific and special dog to, yeah. to do that. You know, no, no two ways about it. Um, any, any notable or cool SWAT stories beyond the, the first, uh, Actually, but uh, one one thing I'm curious the the swatting right. Mm -hmm. uh, have you guys ever run into that where where people are you familiar with that the like where if I'm correct where basically people somebody like calls in almost like a prank to get a SWAT team oh, to yes. come in un, unnecessarily or whatever yep. on something. So we've ne we've never had that. Now, <clears throat> uh, a few cities over from us did have had that, but yeah. uh, we we've never had that happen. Yeah. Um, you know we. We've been compromised a few times, you know, by could people get on the scanner and figure out what frequency we're going to use and yeah. show up and it's a ghost town. He's like, what the, you know, oh, no five shit. minutes late, five minutes ago, it was wide open. You know? Yeah. So we've had that, but we haven't had to where yeah. they call us to come and yeah, and it, it didn't happen. We, we were, like I say, we were, we're pretty fortunate. We didn't have a whole lot of uh, nonsense. You know what I mean? We were, I, I think it's because the dynamics of the city, but also the proactiveness of the police that, we tried to really keep the crime down. We were yeah. pretty active to where it just never, never got that out of hand. Right. Yeah. Out of hand. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. Were there, uh, you, do you, do you recall how many times since it, its inception and you being on it, that it was that the SWAT team was called in? Oh gosh. I, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, it's because there'd be some years it was, when we first started the SWAT team, nobody else had one either. Yeah. So it'd be, it'd be daily or weekly. If you were on the SWAT team, you're also assigned to patrol, you know, you weren't. So it was a collateral duty. Yep. Yeah. And so you just knew when you went to bed, you had to put your SWAT clothes out and your patrol clothes out because yeah. probably two, three times that week you were getting called in because not so much. It was just your city, but it was the next city and the next wow. city who didn't have it. And now they all have them. Yeah. So over the years it's grown. And what, what response time wise from the time that 
that the call goes out? What what kind of time? So we 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 require under an hour, you know, from a guy. In fact, like for the longest time, you had to live within such a distance to get in there. But really, from the time you call out, within probably twenty minutes, the first group of guys are yeah. loading up and getting there. Yeah. So, <clears throat> what uh, what did you guys carry for your primary? Uh, we had either Glock forty, uh, and then. Or now a Glock fifty seven or three fifty seven or, or nine. So for uh for the SWAT team long gun wise, if you were going on it, um you, you either had an MP five or you had a you know some type of AR. Yeah. So. Did you have a preference? Um, I I had AR. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and it was just what I got used to. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah, I had it for. Yeah, to me the only I mean I I used an MP five once on a on a real world mission. It was uh actually twice i guess but one where we were actually you know really fucking doing it in, in iraq and uh <clears throat> and it was you know it was really because of the the environment you know but that nine mil i mean i, I wouldn't want to go into a lot of places like th- thinking of it from a, yeah. a domestic swat like i would i wouldn't want to have an mp5 and it was just know, the but, uh i guess it was a psychological too you know yeah. when the when the ar went off it was it gave a presence and when the mp5 when he didn't even know they fired it you know yeah, so to me, a, a Sig fucking Rattler cane break like a three hundred blackout would be would be what I would want for that environment probably. But uh, at any rate, um, all right. So, kind of getting into big picture law enforcement wise, you know, as somebody who has spent you know three decades basically in law enforcement, and, and you know, going from the nineties until here just a few months ago, um, what what is your take slash opinion? on kind of the 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 status or the nature of of law enforcement throughout that throughout your career and kind of you know where it was where it transpired to and kind of where it is now like how how do you see it for as far as a law enforcement's perspective it's completely restricted you know i mean it's uh it went from being able to take care of crime to yeah just the complete restriction. Now, on the outside of that, we went from not a whole lot of regulations, do whatever we kind of wanted, you know, it, it, in, a, in a perspective to this is a list of parameters that you 100% can't cross and, and go over. So that's good and bad, you know. So it's good that there is a a boundary now, you know, that this says, hey, this is the standard we keep. You know, this is not just – whatever you want to do or whatever group of guys thinks best, this is what we got to do. So I think as far as the structure and the the balance of it is a way more professional now yeah. than it, than it was. But I think the, the, the ability to fight crime is less. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for instance, for, for us to, to arrest a DUI back nineties, two thousands, whatever, 45 minutes. I mean, from the time you pull them over, get them there, breath of life, whatever you're going to do, uh, do your paperwork out the door, 45 minutes, I'm back on the road. Now with the, with the laws and what you have to do and not do and search warrants to get breath and all that. I mean, you're talking three, four hours. Wow. So what, what took 45 minutes 10 years ago takes four hours. So and that's four hours that they're taking you away from everything right. else. Right. So that's an officer that's not on the road. Yeah. So, but in a hypothetical, let's say you 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 ha- you're in the middle of that process, right? And a call comes in where it's like, "Hey, shots fired!" You know what? What like the shit has gone completely off the fucking rails? Is there a, a scenario where you'd be like, "Fucking beat it," and you leave? Yeah, I was, there's <clears throat> there's always been times that where it's like, "Hey, this is your core lucky fucking lucky day. Of day," yeah, and because you know you're going to take pressing over something yeah. else. But um, most of the time, most of the time. Uh, we had enough guys that yeah. that we could swap over, and you know, if if they were already at the jail around the way of the jail, they would take them, drop them, say, "Hey, we'll be back in a couple hours." You yeah. know, and but there, there's always and there always will be times that we in the middle of something say, "Hey, yeah. good luck, <laughs> congratulations, <laughs> my friend." You know me, you know, oh, that's <laughs> we're, we're gone. So yeah, man, yeah. yeah I mean, I, it, it sounds like <laughs> there's there's to me there seems to be a correlation of of our entire society swinging that way you know and and law enforcement is just no exception is that whether it's parenting you know military police just our society and culture has 
overcorrected itself to to the point where now it's it's equally as bad just in in the 180 degree it is different you know? yeah i mean it's just it's just i don't know it's it's almost mind-boggling at times to realize that where we've come yeah you know, just in that 30 years yeah it's like there's zero respect you know I, that's not in a whole but you know as a as a society kind of as a youth the respect for for authority period you know because it's not just police it's it's again it's parents it's teachers yes it's you know really any any authoritative authoritative figure gets kind of lumped into that same demand category and 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 it's like fuck you you know and and but there's no consequence for no consequence and there's no you know there's nothing not a whole lot we as law enforcement can do about it yeah and and you know it used to be you know like say if I caught Johnny doing something, and I called his parents. Well, nine out of ten times, I didn't have to take care of it because yeah. when the parents showed up, he's like, going to we'll get way more. It. Yeah, yeah. But now they're arguing with you. Yeah, and, I'm yeah. the I'm the problem that their kids yeah. out here stealing stuff. You yeah. know, I'm the problem that the kids out here smoking dope and, and yeah. you know robbing the store. I mean, I, wow. You know, it's 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 instantly against the police or society. Then nobody takes responsibility for yeah. anything anymore. Yeah. So that I think that's, um, and that's where I look at the guys that are just now coming on. I'm thinking, man. Yeah, you got your hands full. You got 30 years of this. And yeah. this is this is where I had to get out because I couldn't stand it no more. You're just starting. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I hope that uh, it, at least somewhat gradually or, or at some point, starts to drift back towards the middle for the yeah. sake of our fucking society. Uh, yeah, it's going to have you know? to in order for us to survive. Yeah. Um, I am curious, like from a call standpoint, um, did, did you ever find yourself on calls like from a domestic standpoint where – where you found it hard to to deal with where you come in like living environments with kids or, or things sure. like that. Like, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I, I guess the, the reason I ask is just, you know, in, in trying to understand what, what you guys have to go through and deal with, like obviously the, the cool, cool guy stories sure. of, you know, chasing the dude in the auto parts thing or the, you know, the gun, you know, but there, there's a whole other side sure. that, to me, I, I think as a as a dad and and a brother and and whatever that that would be really hard for me in in your guys' shoes that I I really, um, you know, take my hat off to you guys for for dealing with that and and being able to fucking deal with some of those scenarios. Uh, right. If you could talk to that a little bit, I think I think as in order to keep your sanity, you have to just separate yourself from your job from your emotional feelings about it because if you don't I, I really don't think you could last very long at all because you know you're going into situations where hey there's laws against domestic this is no choice for us this is what we got to do but yet maybe that person doesn't really need to be going to jail but the law says it's required you know yeah. and you look over and there's two or three kids that now know they've lost their income they lost you know i mean yeah. Dad's going to jail. He's probably going to lose his job or whatever it is, mom or whatever. You know, or the Do you same. have any discretion at that point? Or are there certain things? There's certain you, things that, like, say, domestic, if there's certain things <clears throat> that the law requires, you have no yeah. discretion whatsoever. Yeah. Um, if there's any sign of violence whatsoever, it's required. Yeah. What uh, what constitutes a sign of violence? So, that? you know, it could be, could be anything, any kind of injury whatsoever, any kind of – it can be down to a red mark as long as you can articulate – yeah. What happened and that correlates with what she's saying or he's saying. We have just as many on male on female as female on male. So is is that new? It is new. I, or newer. Newer. And and I don't know that it's new. I think it's the generation where the group of men are willing to tell. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's it's new that guys would actually be like, Yeah, she she, yeah, whipped, she whipped me. She yeah. hurt me bad. You yeah. know what I mean? So I mean it's it is a new idea of it. Um I don't I don't think it's any different yeah i think it's just how the reporters don't report yeah it, you know so yeah. yeah that's fucking wild shit um any other uh crazy stories from your your career that uh that pop out as as being noteworthy or, or <sighs> gosh i don't know you know it's crazy like t- i tell my wife i said when i go home i try to block out everything i did for the day you yeah. know i mean i and, and then like when me and my buddies be sitting around you go you remember that and like Oh my gosh, that was the cool, forget. Yeah, that was the coolest thing. You yeah, know? I mean, it's the coolest thing we ever did. So, yeah. but uh, I, I think for me, it was just a whole of just the whole experience of coming home one day and saying, "Man, 
Yeah. Nobody else got to do that, you know, yeah. in the world. And then yeah. the next day I'm coming home, it's like, that's the worst job I've ever had in my life. You know? <laughs> yeah. Did you have any uh, really close calls, um, whether it was, you know, high speed things or getting shot at or like any, like, holy fuck, how did I make it through that? Yeah. And, and, and some of them are just like, uh, you know, we had some, I, I don't know when a lot of it is like, you know, you get in there and you do start doing the fights or you start chasing and you get all done and you say, Oh my God, that was, yeah. that's two seconds away of dying right there. I, yeah. You know, if that dude had done that, we'd been dead or, you yeah. know, if we stepped in that room at that time, he, he'd have killed us. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, there's, there's all, you know, there's just all kinds of them through the, through the years that you just look back and think, what a dumb thing I just did. I could have, you know, I could have got it on that one, but yeah. Uh, and, and I think a lot of it is like, um, for me, it was back in the day when we chase a car and run up and snatch the guy out of the car and then realize, Oh my gosh, he's got a gun in his hand, you know? Yeah. And you're too late. You're already attached, you yeah. know, and you're thinking, oh, the stupidest thing I ever did. Yeah. And it was only by the fact that whether he decided yay or not, <clears throat> yeah. it, you know, that was the only thing that stopped you from, from yeah. dying that moment, that, that dude's decision. In cases like that, it was like a, a traffic stop where he, he ran or what? Yeah. So like, um, you know, like most of the time, uh, unfortunately in our world, like when, you know, the personality says we got to go get them. So we chase them down. We got to go get them. When they when they crash, they bail, whatever. Boom, we're on the chase. Instead, you know, in reality, what you do is sit back and you know wait it out, call them out. But you know where we get in trouble is we dive in, and then when you yeah. dive in, you go look over and go, "Oh my gosh, you know yeah. what about just happened to me?" Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, uh, I mean, as crazy as it may sound uh, at first, I, I think humans in that regard have prey drive the same way animals do 100%. You know? and it's it's instinctual like you don't think about it you just do it you know i can remember one time i <clears throat> was in a car chase and this is back in the 90s we was in a car chase and the guy gets down in the field gets stuck you know he starts to get stuck so we run down there break the window out i reach in to to get him and the passenger reaches over and grabs me so i'm half yeah. in half out and off they go holy shit <laughs> yeah. man and so here i am sticking out thinking that's one of the moments. Where I thought, that's the fuck was I thinking? Yeah, that's really stupid. Yeah. And luckily it worked out. They got stuck again. I got out. But, you know. How, do you know about how fast they got going when you were hanging no, out? No, I really yeah. don't. I was just hoping on for the best. But yeah. it was a little Mustang. I can remember it. A little Mustang GT. And just, <laughs> I mean, it was, it's crazy. But it's, crazy. It's one of the moments where you think, that was really stupid, man. Yeah. 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 Wow. I should have thought that one through, you know. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> wild shit. And, and, you know, I was, like I was talking to Neil and I said, uh, you know, we're, we're in a city where we're pretty lucky. Yeah, it's just a drop in a bucket of what some guys go through. Yeah, daily. Yeah, you know no, I know it. Yeah, I mean, I've I've had you know some guys on here that you know some of the stories they tell aren't any different than some of the shit that that our guys have yeah. been through overseas. You know, right. I mean, it's like shooting people with long guns from a parking lot to a fucking apartment complex type shit. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, shit that yep. it's like it's no fucking different than you know shit that I've been through. You know, it's, yeah. it's fucking wild. Yeah, it is. It is crazy, and so. Uh, I, I tell him, I said, man, we're, we're just lucky. You yeah. I mean, just, we just, yeah. Because I'm thinking hey, there's guys that deal with that yeah. daily. Yeah. You know? uh, so your department has uh, six dogs, you said? Yeah. And they're all dual purpose? So we have one single purpose EOD dog. Okay. And so uh, he's just, that's all he does. Yeah. And the rest are? Dual purpose. Are uh, they? They're dual purpose narcotic. Yeah. So with mine leaving, we didn't, we didn't uh, add another one yet. Yeah. So we just have one bomb dog and, and four narcotic explosive or four narcotic dual purpose dogs yeah okay uh so what for you now now you're just focusing on on the company and yeah so i'm just switch roles and you know before i didn't ever want to advertise or do anything because i was just i was overwhelmed to begin with i couldn't keep up with what i had to begin with so yeah i decided hey i'm going to get it when i whenever i was eligible to get out i took my time and and yeah. left and and now i'm just going to focus on my on my business and yeah and, and get it where I want it to be. It's, it's, it, it's there where I want it to be now, but I'm going to move it. I, you know, I got like a four or five year plan that I'd like to. Yeah. You plan on staying in that area? Yeah. So. I'm just going to stay there. Yeah. How old are your kids? If you don't mind me. So I have a 22 year old, a 20 year old, an 18 year old and a 15 year old. Wow. So pretty, uh, pretty close together then. Yeah. So they're, uh, once are you, are you planning on staying there even once they're all out of the house? Uh, yeah. Unless something changes my, my, my long-term goal really with my business is to get to where you know, I have enough people that 
they can do a lot of the work for me. And I can, yeah. And I can, yeah. you know, I can travel a little bit or do, do a little bit of something else. So, yeah. Uh, but that's probably not for a few years, but that's my goal. And I'm, I'll stay until my youngest one gets on her yeah. own. And then I'll, hey, I mean, to me as an entrepreneur, that should, that should be your, your goal is that, you know, because if, whatever your business is because i'm the exact same way like i if if i wake up and i'm 60 years old and i'm still scrubbing shit off of a kennel wall i've done something fucking wrong wow. you know yeah. um like to me the the goal is is to create something to where whether you're there or not is fucking irrelevant right. you know exactly. um but uh, that's hard hard to do it is hard uh, to do it's hard it's i think it's personality too you, you yeah. think nobody else can do it but you yeah and, you know, they're not gonna do it the way you want it done and, yeah no there, there's certainly a an element of ego that you have to be able to stifle and, and suppress yeah. um and just realize that you know things aren't going to be exactly you know how how maybe you want but I, I think the the key not to get too far off on a tangent business wise but you know, not micromanaging, just being like, here, here's what I want done. And that's it. Like, mm -hmm. I don't care how, how you get there, you know, from yep. A to B is, is for you to decide, like, here's, here's what I need. Here's the standard. The rest of it is fucking, you know, it, it's up to you, you yep. know? And I think most people appreciate that too, you know, but it's like what to do or how to do it, but not both. Yeah. You know? That's but, it. That's, yeah. that's it. And so I, I'm hoping that that's what progresses with mine in the first yeah. few years. And then, yeah. Try to enjoy life a little yeah. bit. Yeah, amen. How old are you? <laughs> 51. 51. Well, rock and roll, man. Anything else you want to uh, bring up, talk about? I believe that's yeah. that's good. I that appreciate it. Up. Well, thank you again. Uh, you know, my hat's off to you and, and all law enforcement out there. I know you guys have a, a thankless job uh, in many ways from our dickhead society that uh, that we have. And, and uh, you know, I just want to kind of reiterate that, uh, you know the the support for you guys is uh, is unwavering on this end, and and I hope that uh, that everybody out there stays safe. I hope people listening that don't have uh, any relation or or a huge understanding of law enforcement have a better understanding of what these guys go through day in day out, um, and uh, and hopefully <clears throat> uh, have have received or gotten even more respect than uh, than before you started listening. So uh, thank you again for coming and, and sharing you your story. Me. I appreciate it. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. I want to, again, thank everybody for uh, your support show after show. If uh, if it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't be able to uh, do do interviews like this and, and be able to sit down and, and do this. So I appreciate it very much. Uh, if you didn't enjoy it, feel free to choke yourself. And until <laughs> next time, this is Mike Drop.